Hi, welcome, uh, welcome you to our school committee meeting on Wednesday, January 24th, 2024 at 7.08. Please note we are video videotaping as well as live streaming on our YouTube channel and the recordings will be available on our YouTube ch channel. Please read, rise and join the Pledge of Allegiance. standing for a moment of silence or remember members who we remember, members of the community who passed away um, and their families in particular. Mr. Jaffe, who served as the Raina Middle School principal, um, passed away. He was principal for over 26 years. the chair. Um, also in attendance is Ms. Barry, there you are, Ms. Tola Babalola, um, Mr. Schatz, um, our recording secretary, Ms. McDougall, and I would also um, like to acknowledge the Bridgewater Town Council and the selectmen for joining us tonight. At this point, we will move into public comment. Um, the school committee welcomes information, concerns, and opinions from those attending the meeting in order to give those wishing up to speak ensure compliance with open meeting law and other legal obligations and avoid disruption of the meeting, the committee will not engage with the speaker or with one another in deliberation on comments as they are presented during public comment. It is, is at the discretion the committee may schedule issues raised by a speaker for deliberation at future meetings. If you would like a personal response, please email the committee or Mr. Powers directly following the meeting. The chair will now open up public comment for a period of 12 minutes per policy BEDH, and I would ask anyone who wishes to speak to please approach the podium, provide your name and address, and respectfully ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. When your three minutes are up and you've still not finished, I will ask you to submit your thoughts or script to our reporting secretary, Ms. McDougall, and she will distribute them to the committee for our review. Is there anyone here for public comment? So we'll move to um, correspondence and recognition, and I'll start with correspondence. Um, I received an uh, email from a parent regarding the incident that occurred in the classroom, also an email from a parent regarding special education, an email from a former employee, an email from a parent regarding, uh, from parents regarding the new students entering into the district. Mr. Oh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So I have the privilege and honor to attend the Excel graduation on Wednesday, January 10th. I, I know some of the members of the committee were there as well. Uh, as you know, the Excel program is our evening uh, high school, uh, provides an alternative education for students that are just not able to uh, attend for whatever reason the day school, but it could be because they have to um, uh, you know, work and provide for families. Uh, they may have disengaged from school and now re-engaged. Uh, but it really is a program that provides our students an opportunity to fulfill their dreams and goals, and that is to uh, first by started you know starting off by graduating from high school. Uh, so it was a very exciting night. We actually had one of our um, graduates enrolling uh, or uh, has enlisted in the Marines, uh, and so his uh, uh, recruiter attended as well. We was here to congratulate and welcome him. Um, I actually think. Mr. Dolan, if I'm correct, he was shipping out pretty uh, pretty soon after after the graduation, so he may have actually already already left. So we wish him well, and, and obviously, uh, you know, thinking of him. Uh, but the other graduates, it was it was great. Uh, there were 12 students uh, total who were slated to graduate that evening, and it just I know as a district and, and certainly as a superintendent, I'm just proud of their great determination that they've shown to uh, you know meet their dream and, and achieve their high school diploma. So it was it was a great evening. Um, not that I. Regular day school graduation isn't, uh, but this one just has a, a little uh, more of a special feel. So it was uh, an honor to be there. So I, I was also there that night, um, and I just want to say these kids are <coughs> the most, I, I, I can't even. 
you want these kids to graduate. Resilient. Yes. And, and I heard a comment, and it was about, um, it's not about showing off, it's about showing up. Those kids show up. And for those kids to come there that night. And I think it was, um, uh, shoot, uh, Staff Sergeant McGill, McGillbury, Sarah? Mulvey. Mulvey. Yeah. <laughs> so the very next day, um, I was at Bridgewater Middle School, and a student came in. She was late. And she says, I was at my brother's graduation last night, and he's going into the, he's, he's joined the Marines. And she was so excited for him. And this staff sergeant gave the family, like, care packages. And it, and it was so special for her and for them. And that night was so special. So thank you, Sarah. And, and everybody else that, that was in, involved in that. So again, it's, it's not about showing off, it's about showing up. And um, you were also there. It was a special night. It was. It was a special night. And those are the most precious kids and the ones that you want to see succeed. If you did not have that program, those students would not have graduated. So I just want to um, commend the Excel program. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a recognition that I wanted to um, note. Um, last night, um, our school resource officer, um, Lou Pacheco, received um, the Rainham Recognition Award from the Board of Selectmen in Rainham. Um, I did nominate him individually. Um, he is such a partner to the school as our school resource officer and many, many community groups um, at the high school and within the different towns. Um, so I felt that he was very deserving in nominating him. Um, he received that award last night um, by the Board of Selectmen. Um, and I went to that meeting last night and I could not imagine how many people were there. Like the, the town's support of him was amazing um, and very deserving. And I just wanted to recognize him and let the committee know um, that he received that last night. And I have never seen that many people at a Selectmen's meeting, <laughs> which was amazing. So congratulations. Um, at this point, I'll move into the consent agenda. Um, I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as, as presented. So moved. Second. Uh, motion to be made by Mr. Dahl and second by Mrs. Uh, Martelli. All those in favor? Any right. discussion? Yeah. Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Um, at this point, um, uh, Mrs. King, the educational report? Uh, sure. Um, I do have a brief student advisory council report, um, Madam Chair. Um, the student advisory council was not able to attend this evening due to multiple conflicts uh, with the students this month. They had work, sports, and clubs. I think several are at the DECO competition, um, so they were not able to make it. Um, so they will be at the February meeting with their report. Um, but I did want to report out on that as we meet um, before school several um, days out of the month, um, one of those dates, they requested Ms. Watson to attend their meeting before school. Um, so she did attend on January 3rd and spoke to them about her budget process and what that looked like. Um, since we've been going through the budget process, we've been focusing on um, that aspect this past month with them. Um, so she did attend, uh, walked them through her high school uh, budget process, what goes into that. Um, they were very engaged. Um, she answered all of their questions. They were very excited to have her there, so thank you for being there and entertaining that um, ask of them. Um, um, I did try and encourage them if they wanted to speak to different admin, if they had other things they wanted to talk about, um, that they should do that. So they did want to invite also Mr. Powers, um, so he did attend the January 10th meeting. Um, so Superintendent Powers and Ms. Babalola attended that student advisory council meeting before school. Um, he reported out on his district budget process, over the, how it is in regards to the whole district, um, and how he prioritizes needs and where the funding comes from. Um, he clarified some points for them and answered questions from their committee. Um, I'm, as we go through this year, as I've been with them for the past couple of years, I'm always impressed at such a young age. The questions that they are able to come up with, um, how they're able to engage admin, so hopefully we can continue that work on
Thank you, Mrs. King. And at this point, I'll ask the superintendent for his report. Ah, uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. Um, I'm not going to steal her thunder, but I did want to just preview. Uh, very excited to announce that we did hold our first staff wellness fair on January 10th. Ms. Healy is going to be giving you more detail on that. But uh, as you know, one of our strategic, uh, one of the pillars as part of our strategic plan, our student success plan, is human capital. And we really uh, have a focus this year on uh, promoting uh, staff wellness. And so this was an idea raised early on in the year, and Ms. Healy and her department organized uh, such a great event for our staff, very well received, but I know she's gonna share more information, but I did want to just acknowledge her and her department and all those that were involved, and what a great day it was. So thank you, Ms. Healy, to, to you and your team and everyone that was involved. Um, I know Ms. Westell is uh, coming down in, in a minute. I did want to just give a, a quick update on our new students uh, that have enrolled in the district through the emergency assistance program through the state. Uh, it has been uh, nothing but a positive experience thus far. I want to publicly acknowledge and thank all those families that reached out uh, for offers of uh, bare necessities, uh, winter coats, hats, gloves, food, whatever uh, these families may need. Uh, truly appreciate that and I wanted to just take that opportunity, take this opportunity to acknowledge them. Uh, as I said, we approximately uh, welcome approximately 28 students, uh, K through 12. So we really, we did, we did not see uh, a significant increase in any one grade level, uh, any one classroom. Uh, so we really, uh, it's been a, such a positive experience. Uh, many of the administrative teams, central office and the buildings have spent uh, quite a bit of time over at the home to suites, getting to know the students, getting to know the families. Um, it's actually somewhat uh, heartening when you walk through and you get a, you know, the, the eyes get wide, you get a smile from one of the families that recognizes you in the lobby. So it's, it, it's great. Uh, and just so impressed with our students. I mean, obviously they've come uh, from near and far and, and their journey is uh, something that I, I could not imagine, but in, in talking with one of our high school students, he actually speaks four languages. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I struggle to get through one some days. Uh, so, you know, the fact that uh, he, he is able to uh, learn and uh, understand and speak four languages is just so impressive. And, and we're finding that with, with the majority of these students. Uh, they're just, they're really enhancing the school system and, and all the students that, uh, that are here. So just, uh, it's, it's been great thus far. Uh, but I did want to uh, invite Ms. Westell down. As you know, the other principals have come before you to share their school improvement plans. Um, each school is uh, required uh, as, as part of uh, national law to have a school improvement plan uh, and establish a school improvement council. Uh, I've asked the principals uh, to submit those plans uh, to me, to Ms. Barry, and we reviewed them and approved them. Uh, but obviously, as part of our uh, process, uh, it's also important that you, as a school committee, uh, you know, are informed of, of what the schools have planned. So I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Westall to uh, share her school improvement plan. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, and Superintendent Powers. Thank you for having me here this evening. The elementary, Merrill Elementary School Improvement Plan is aligned with the district's student success plan. And this plan was developed in collaboration with school administrators, staff, and families. <coughs> At this time, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the Merrill School Council who assisted in the creation of this plan. And that would be Mrs. Colleen Swart, Mrs. Katrina Fisher, Mrs. Ellen Fritz, Mrs. Cassandra Magalia, and Mr. Craig Poulos. As you know, the district student success plan, which drives our school improvement plans, is based upon four pillars, safe and supportive schools, curriculum instruction and assessment, operations and human capital. Although we have multiple school-based actions items built into this plan, I would like to highlight several of our action items at this time. Under safe and supportive <coughs> schools, we are focused on implementing weekly grade level so social emotional lessons facilitated by our school psychologists and school adjustment counselors. These lessons foster student learning of age appropriate social skills in social settings. Under curriculum instruction and assessment, we are focused on conducting weekly grade level common planning time meetings for both kindergarten and grade one. These meetings are facilitated by our total, Title I coach and math coach, and this strengthens the implementation of our new curriculum and promotes teacher collaboration. Under operations, we are focused on advocating for the need of touchscreen Chromebooks for our, our students in the library. Under human capital, we are focused on developing wellness opportunities to our, for our staff through our wellness committee. These are several of our highlights, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. <coughs> any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Mr. Powers, is I, I know, um, I think that the town of Rainham has done things, but there are two uh, particular moms in Rainham that have done a lot of collecting of items for families over at Home to Suites. If people would like more information, I'm happy to connect them to the, the two uh, mothers that happen to be doing a lot of work around <coughs> this. Um, I'm happy to connect them if you want more information. I think yesterday they dropped, or today they dropped off enough stuff to fill the whole National Guard's office full of stuff. And my understanding right now is some of the top items they're looking for is baby wipes actually right now. Um, so, anyway, thank you. Uh, next we'll move on to special education protocols. This is hard. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, and Superintendent Ryan. required of all school districts is to have a policy and procedure manual for the special education department. We've updated our existing manual since it hadn't been updated for several years. There weren't many changes to the actual content, but instead the goal was to ensure that our policies match the most current laws and regulations. An overview of some, some of the changes that were made were the removal of the preschool handbook, because once that is re revised and updated, that will be a separate document. Also, we created an appendix section in which, which includes several documents that are included in the special education process. The purpose for this is for families to be able to preview and become familiar with all of those documents. It is important for our department and district that families are a part of the special <coughs> education process and that we want them to be able to, we want to be able to provide resources like these to be able to so support their involvement. Our legal counsel has reviewed this document and it will be submitted to DESE as well as posted on our website under the special education section. Do you have any questions? Uh, I know this has been a labor of kind of love, if you can call it that, over the last couple months. Um, and you've worked very hard. Um, it's been something that I know myself and others have advocated for um, a few years to get updated. My question is, is will there be um, I know we post on our website, it's to a DESE, and it, it's very, it, a lot of it's driven from federal regular, you know, regulations and state regulations of what is in there. Will there be some process to um, to issue it or uh, to families and let them see the updated version? Yes, so um, we would like to use our CPAP forum uh, to be able to generate conversations around it and if, if uh, families want to want to provide feedback or any type of um, question and answer just to go over because it is a very comprehensive manual um, and I know people don't necessarily have time to sit and read 123 pages but uh, we want to make sure that families are understanding where to look if they have questions about the policies and procedures so that that CPAC forum is a great forum to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, Policy subcommittee, Mr. Daniel. Budget. Or budget. Oh, sorry, I was skipping ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Mrs. King. I was just going to move along. I was like, oh, the whole wants to skip budget. Sorry. So this is Mrs. King's night. It's a budget, right? Sorry. No. No, not, not yet. <laughs> After we hear from Mr. Powers. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. On Monday, January 8th, 2024, the Budget Subcommittee met at 5.30 p.m. in the Superintendent's Conference Room. In attendance were Mrs. Conrad Labarento, Mr. Fitzgibbons, Mrs. Martelli, Superintendent Powers, Assistant Superintendent Barry, Director of Business Services, Ms. Babalola, Treasurer, Ms. Rubichaud, Base Program Director, Ms. Bell, our Recording Secretary, Mrs. McDougall, and myself. We also had one community member in attendance. Um, the first discussion we had um, was regarding the base program. Um, as you know, this has been something that we've um, had many discussions for the past several months on. Um, the base program um, is a revolving account and it is not self-funding at this moment. We are running in the red currently every month. Um, so we had a long discussion at the January subcommittee meeting. Um, Mr. Powers and Ms. Bell presented us the current status of the program. Um, and we reviewed documents and updates regarding staffing, current registration numbers, and budget tracking. One of the issues we are running into is 
the number is so fluid regarding how many people are there on a weekly and monthly basis. Um, so we discussed several options, such as instituting a registration fee for summer programming and ongoing for next school year. Um, we also discussed further strategies such as raising prices and or ending programs in locations that are not being utilized to capacity, such as the BMS program. Um, at the end of our discussion, we did put on the floor a motion to institute the $25 fee for student registrations to be commenced starting with the summer program. Um, I then requested further documentation from Ms. Bell and indicated I would also speak to Ms. McRae at Rainham Park and Rec so we can see what his current pricing is so we can potentially try and align with that. Um, our prices are currently very, very low. We don't need the program to be a revenue source, but we definitely need it to be self-funded and not to be running in the red. Um, so I did get that information from Mr. McRae actually this week. Um, and we have further documents from Ms. Bell. So I had also said at that meeting that Mr. Fitzgibbons and I would meet separately to try and bring a recommendation to the subcommittee to try and get a motion on the floor that is not raising the prices to an exorbitant amount that parents would be not be able to afford, but that the program is not running in a deficit. So we are working on that part of it to bring to our February subcommittee meeting. Um, I'm gonna reach out and Mr. Fitzgibbons and I, Mrs. Bell and Mr. Powers are gonna meet before the next meeting. Um, but we did end with the $25 fee registration at the very least for right now to be instituted. Um, and the rest will try and come as a package to the next full meeting once we get through subcommittee with some sort of recommendation regarding pricing structure. Um, accordingly, Madam Chair, as with the recommendation of the budget subcommittee, at this time I would make a motion to institute a $25 registration fee per student for the base summer program. Second. Motion to be made by Mrs. King, second by Mr. Fitzgibbons. Any discussion? If I may, Madam Mr. Chair, ask the question. So this registration fee would be for the summer with a family who puts their child in base in the summer and then in the fall pay the $25 for the fall as well? Correct, it would be okay. separate. Okay. Um, we're gonna try and iron out all other details for next month. We okay. can kind of get down the yep. every month because up until now, the numbers were still so fluid, people were still registering, um, but I don't wanna put it off anymore. It's okay. already January now, and mm -hmm. I don't wanna go into another school year because we're having to fund it out of the operational rate. And we want families to have enough time to plan yeah. for that. We don't want to spring it on them, right. but we also, you know, we can't run a program that's not funding itself. And also, sorry, uh, Radium Pack and Rep does have a registration fee as well. Yeah. So we want to kind of keep it in line with what they're doing. Yeah. I, I'd just like to say I appreciate the hard work that Mrs. King has put in and look forward to meeting to talk about the appropriate fee structure for base. Um, it, it's really very, very different than the Rainham Park and Rec model, which is the thing that makes it difficult to understand. But I think we both have the same idea that we're not trying to make a ton of money off of people. We just need enough to make it work and not, um, not have it be a draw on the operational budget, especially as we go into this coming year, where again, it feels like the towns may not be able to fulfill what we're going to see later tonight uh, due to their circumstances, which is completely understandable. But we can't we can't say we need more unless we're keeping our own fiscal house in order. So, thank you, Mrs. King. Thank you, Mr. King. And he and I are going to meet. He's the numbers guy. <laughs> I'm the organizer. Organizer. And this is the registration fee, like per student. Like if it's a family, like, they would still pay like twenty five for each. Child. It's per student. It's per student. And Mrs. King, I, I would just like to add is this registration fee is pretty standard within the, I, I say, child care sphere. Um, per child, there's usually a registration fee to help process the paperwork and all of the administration activities that have to go along with registering kids, whether summer camp, whether daycare, whether after school programs, it's a pretty standard thing. And it's per, per child, typically. Are there other mm -hmm. comments or questions that have been student? Um, which student groups are most likely
likely to use the base program, and are there any equity concerns about access to the program if we um, raise add a uh, fee as well as raise the fee? So, do you want to know? How can, I, can I try? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think there are avenues that we can access to figure out. Um, you know, certainly. We don't want to turn anyone away for uh, lack of ability to pay, but at the same point in time, we do need to run uh, a program that is at least break even, if not a little bit, to the positive every year so that they can buy new supplies and stuff from that surplus. So uh, that'll be a discussion we can take up with the superintendent, Ms. Bell, in our conversations. Um, Mrs. Kang, if you don't mind, and just make sure, you know, anyone who's on a free reduced lunch, et cetera, et cetera, we, we have ways of identifying students in need and, uh, and make sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're not uh, disadvantaging them, if that's fair. Does that feel okay? No, it does. Yeah. Um, and as part of these discussions being had, are parents going to be able to um, lend their thoughts to this decision? And parents are always welcome to attend any budget subcommittee meeting we have, and I know Ms. Bell was getting antsy about the timing of it because she does not want to wait until the last minute because parents are already reaching out for summer program. Um, so she definitely wants to get information out to them so there's a notification to them of like, hey, the fees might change, if that's gonna change any like impact in any way. Um, and they're always welcome to attend any of our budget meetings. And I would say is, is they're also welcome to come here and public comment yeah. around commenting on the fees and the impact or, or, or not or, or around them. I would just say historically in the past, I, I think from talking to Mr. Powers and Mrs. Bell, that there has been at times where they have waived some of the fees. Um, it, I think that's something that the base program needs to think about and manage and be conscious of what they're waiving or not waiving and, and families that are in need. Or, so there are, there are ways, depending on the families, mm -hmm. to waive some of these. And our emails are always open. Find us on the website if you have any issues, be it base or any others. Send us emails and let us know what you think. That's very important. So I just want to follow up on that. So based on what I'm hearing, that we do have parents reaching out, wanting to know if um, what's happening with base in the summer at that point of contact, are they being informed that this is a discussion being had because parents are really busy, and to your point, they're using base, so their availability to attend a budget meeting that's usually 5, 5.30 or come here, that demographic of parents who are tending to use base may not have the time. So at the time of outreach, are we inviting them into the conversation saying, I'm so sorry, there's a delay here, but we, we won't we, to get their input because they're actually self-identifying, it sounds like they're actively reaching out and wanting this information. So at the January meeting, we did tell Ms. Bell and directed her to let parents know when they're contacting her that normally around this time, she does start taking registrations for the summer, so she is telling parents, we're, that's on hold right now while we figure out the new pricing structure if, a, if we do price that. So she is telling parents that, that it has started to reach out as well. That's a different question. Informing them and letting them know we're in discussions about the price, pricing structure is different than inviting them to speak on that. So is she just giving them notice that this is, discussion is happening or inviting them to provide their input? At this point, it's a notice and it's a still a discussion within budget sub. We have a program that we're running that's running in a deficit right now and we have a poor financial outlook for next year potentially. So we definitely have to make a decision, like Mr. Fitzgibbon said, we're not looking to make money off parents, but we need the program. We've reduced staffing, we've checked staffing levels, potentially we're gonna close BMS since that's not really being utilized. So we're doing everything else we can to make sure that we're not raising it too much, but we also can't run, we can't run a program that's losing money. We did that with pay to ride, and we had to totally close that, and that was horrific. <laughs> so we can't continue for another year to run a program $20,000 every month losing money. Well, my question wasn't about closing the program. It was about having a conversation with the parents so that they can 
contribute to the troubleshooting and even determining what is too much of a fee. How much, so say we say 25 and they're like, we could pay 50. Like it's just, you know, I'm not promoting or advocating for closing it and disregarding what you're saying. I'm just asking specifically if parents are being invited into the conversations that you've all invested a lot of time in, and I could I could sense the sense of urgency here. I'm not overstepping that. So not at this time, but I can talk okay. to Mrs. Bell what she thinks is prudent or how she thinks she could potentially go about that. I appreciate that. Thank you. So there's been a motion made on the floor by Mrs. King. I think Ms. Martelli seconded. Um, at this point, we'll take. Or Mr. Fitzgibbon, sorry. Sorry, no I didn't second. write it down. <laughs> I'll take credit. Um, I've been seconded by Mr. Fitzgibbons. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I oppose. Without having the parents' um, input, I'd like to. Um, I'm not in favor of the 25 year Um uh, Motion passes, seven to one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, also discussed was the proctor salary scale. Um, upon prior budget sub discussions uh, last year and prior to that, um, Mr. Powers um, indicated that he would draft a proposed salary scale for the subcommittee to review. Um, as we know, the proctors are not part of any bargaining unit, um, and therefore they do not get regular raises. Um, the last time that we gave him a raise, I think, was last year, I know. Um, and that was the first raise they had gotten. In quite a long time um, until it came to budget sub to discuss. So as, an, as a good faith effort, we had talked about Mr. Powers creating some sort of salary scale, not to make a step and et cetera, kind of bargaining unit type thing, but just a salary scale that HR could give to them and say, this is what the school committee has promised for the next several years of a positive increase um, over the next X number of years. Um, so we're not trying to make sure the budget sub is constantly turning over, which budget sub might remember, which might not remember. Um, so they can have that to look forward to. Even though proctors are not part of the bargaining unit, they are a very important part of the district. We put them in many different positions throughout the district. Um, and we're trying to work on retention um, with all of our staff and try and you know, make them want to stay here and have something to look forward to. So I think that's important. Um, I know Mr. Powers has a good grasp of what the budget is gonna look like. Um, so hopefully he could put something together that will be within our budget, um, but also something that we can have for HR to present to potential proctors that might come into the district. Um, so he's gonna work on that and we will present that after that comes to budget, so. Um, BMS water heater. Um, Mr. Powers indicated that the heat exchanger on a boiler at BMS recently failed. Um, Mr. Kilgore was able to negotiate a rate of $39,000 for a replacement for that um, heat exchange on the boiler, including the labor. Um, therefore, that was able to he was able to cover those costs within the facility's budget. Um, so no action was taken. That was just an FYI to let the budget sub know about that. Um, class size discussion. Uh, Mr. Fitzgibbons have requested that we put that on the agenda to discuss. Um, as we all know, this has been a topic that we have received many email concerns about. We've had many parents come to um, committee to discuss or rather to give public comment about. Um, we did have a lengthy discussion about this um, with the amount of students that we have at over 5,000 students to make an impact in class size at this time would be a huge financial impact to the district in excess of $3 million. Um, so we really talked about figuring out strategies to provide additional resources to teacher and or different funding sources. Um, even if budget was not a restraint, many of our buildings, especially on the Rainham side, are at capacity. Um, so depending how this spring does go with town elections um, and town meetings, um, it was a recommendation that we have serious discussions, um, especially with the town of Rainham, about a, the potential of a new building in the near future to start talking about that as a serious discussion. 
Um, insurance opt-out uh, for custodian. Mr. Powers also brought to our attention a custodian who had recently requested an insurance opt-out, which is not was not during open enrollment. Um, the custodian contract, unlike the REA contract, is silent um, regarding only allowing it during open enrollment. Um, Mr. Powers and Ms. Babalola indicated that after speaking also with legal counsel, um, there was no cons that they could see of, and it would only be a cost savings to the district. So they were going to go forward with that and send, sign an MOU regarding that one custodian that requested it. Um, so that is something that potentially negotiations should look at with upcoming negotiation um, contracts as well. Um, no uh, action from the committee was needed. Um, Guilfoyle crisis communication. Uh, Mr. Powers was presented with a proposal that he received from Guilfoyle crisis communication for their services. Um, while he acknowledged their communications would be helpful and have been helpful, um, the contract was $24,000 per year um, and would not necessarily be needed on an ongoing basis. They do not have um, a per, per case by case contract at this time. Um, and we do have, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name correctly, Sidorovitz. Sidorovitz. Sidorovitz, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we do have her on staff, which she fulfills that capacity in most cases. So. We can revisit that if needed. Um, it was Mr. Power's recommendation that we do not necessarily need it right now, um, but we could revisit that in the future if we needed. Um, the subcommittee concurred with that recommendation and no action was taken. Uh, minutes of December 11th, 2023 were approved. Uh, fiscal 24 budget report. Um, we reviewed, as we do on a monthly basis, the fiscal year 2024 budget with Ms. Babalola. Um, she also, at that time, we noted the normal pages in the 24 budget, such as special education, electricity and heat, and tuition out of district, which are all lines that we're constantly monitoring. Um, she also gave us a presentation regarding mid-year reviews and transfers for each state function category. We did not take a vote on that, as that is a vote at the end of the year. Um, and it is fluid, but she did provide documentation regarding what the mid-year transfers look like, um, and that was provided in your um, Google Drive. If anyone wants Ms. Bevel to go over those, she can, if you need further information regarding those. Fiscal year 2025 budget prep discussion. Um, Mr. Powers presented to the budget sub his tentative fiscal year 2025 um, budget and his rationale for um, each slide and what his priori priorities were. Um, he will be presenting that, so I won't steal his thunder for that as well. You're more than welcome, Mrs. King. <laughs> <laughs> um, so following this presentation, um, Everyone understand, this is Mr. Powers' budget. <laughs> it is until the end of the, until the end. <laughs> um, once that is approved, it will come back to the budget sub uh, for revisions and edits, um, and will be presented to the public at the public hearing on March 13th, and then at the full committee on March 27th, um, and then sent to the towns for their votes uh, following that. Um, the last thing we did have was Ms. Robichaud presented, um, she had had questions regarding an audit um, and some of the banks that do not currently have dip insurance. Um, she was working with several of the banks to sweep their accounts and invest in other banks that are insured with dip insurance. Um, one of those specifically she is going to use is Eastern Bank. Um, that was not required but would be an added safety measure. Um, at this time, the funds at Eastern Bank have an interest rate of 3.25. If they, we allow them to sweep the account and invest in banks that have different insurance, they will give us a 5% interest rate. Um, Ms. Rubichaud has those particulars in writing and we'll move forward with that. No action was taken at, as this was just um, an FYI to the committee. Um, and that concludes my budget subcommittee report. Thank you, Mrs. Keith. Yes. Um, these are FY13 
2023 audit complete yet? That it's completed, but we're just waiting for the auditor to send us the final. Oh. The draft is available. subcommittee met on January 17th uh, at 5.30 in the superintendent's conference room. Uh, light agenda this month. Uh, we took a look at uh, policy JLCD, the Medication Administration Policy. This uh, was brought towards us by Ms. Claire Grennan, the nurse leader, who was in attendance as well as Mr. Powers, as well as Ms. Nicholson and uh, specifically, Ms. Grennan spoke to what changed, uh, hadn't been changed in some time, uh, and the revisions. First thing, and which was imperative, she said, was about uh, the FDA approved drugs uh, as more and more uh, physicians are starting to prescribe uh, some medications that are not uh, federally uh, approved. This policy that, that was drafted reflects the changes to make sure that it clearly states at the top that it's uh, we will allow FDA to approve drugs to be administered. Um, Ms. Grant also discussed about the administration portion, uh, specifically about having parents bring the medications to the schools instead of coming, uh, allowing the kids to transport them via buses. There's clear language now there as well. Um, you know, while we do uh, encourage some students to do self-serve, uh, you know, language has been added in uh, to uh, show what we will allow as well in that regard. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Grennan did a great job in discussing and Answering all our questions about uh, who, how that decision is made about if a student can self-administer, uh, what classes of students, such as individuals with diabetes, mostly at the high school level, where they've been taught, they've been uh, had years of this, and that goes into consideration. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, we wanted to make sure that this complied with state and federal guidelines. Um, and that, uh, with that, I would like to uh, make a motion to waive the first reading out loud of policy JLC medication policy. Second. Motion's been made by Mr. Dan Marino uh, to waive the first reading of JLCD and second by Mr. Dolan. Is there any discussion? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. DeMarino, if parents have concerns about this, they still have an opportunity before our next meeting to reach out to the policy committee and express their concerns and issues. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. DeMarino, is what's in this policy, most of it, if you will, dictated by the federal government and the state? And state? From Ms. Grennan's report to us, yes. So we can't change very much. Correct. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and that concludes my report for this month. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. This is you. No, oh, Mr. Daniel. Oh. Thank you. This month, I pardon? Sorry, community liaison report. Okay. <laughs> this month, I received communication via office hours and email from a total of three parents, one community, and one community member. And I wanted to do a disclaimer here. Thanks to Laura's feedback and um, guidance, um, one we've saved you a lot of reading, condensed it. But I wanted to emphasize that the 
Um, comments here are not community-wide. They are based on one individual um, parent um, experience. And the purpose, as I understand it, of the community liaison report is to bring to your attention what I, I'm hearing in the community. So I wanted to give that disclaimer. Um, I also invite you all to provide your own feedback as well. I, I want this report to be helpful and useful. And so just as Laura has done, I welcome everyone to kind of give me feedback and let me know what, what more, what less you'd like to see on that. Um, so one parent of a child at the Williams School expressed the following concerns. They indicated that their experience may have been influenced by their status as a new member in the Bridgewater community versus a longtime resident who has personal connections with parent groups, coaches, and teachers. Um, this, this conversation was an hour-long conversation, and so as you'll see in my report, I created some categories just for easy reading. Um, they provided feedback on the parent council, the sports program, parent and family engagement, student safety, curriculum, student achievement, staffing, and middle school lunches. Um, I, I, I won't go through that all right now. It's, it's all there, but I wanted to kind of highlight what the categories are. I also received, um, had a conversation with one parent who expressed concerns about the safety of the new school. They indicated concerns about the roof leaking during periods of heavy rain and impacted, and, it, and its impact on the functionality of elevators. A uh, parent from La Liberty expressed concern about their child's teacher using the word lazy. They believe it's inappropriate and harmful, especially for students with disabilities. They urge the district to investigate and consider staff training on special education needs. Parent was guided to the communication chain and they encouraged to have a face-to-face -face conversation with the teacher. Um, one community member requested a copy of the K through 10 PE curriculum and expressed frustration by what they believe is a lack of con um, concrete document. Um, I encouraged them to reach out to Mrs. Barry, which they did, and they provided some high-level um, feedback here. They highlighted the need for curriculum verification and grade-level progression, questioned how standards compliance is ensured without a central document, expressed interest in state-provided summer workshops on curriculum implementation, and offered enthusiasm for their invitation to participate in future wellness. Um, as always, I do invite these parents and community members to follow the community um, communication chain. As you'll see in the, the, uh, my report, I provide the initials of those who are okay um, and with, with sharing um, what they have said and then indicate those who wanted to remain anonymous. And that's the end of my report. Thank you, Mr. Fitzgibbons. I, I've had multiple conversations with, um, with mainly parents, but some grandparents as well, around class size. So as we've heard earlier in the meeting, I don't need to belabor the point that you know it's a very, very hot topic and a very important issue um, to those who have students in the district, as it is obviously to this committee. And I know we're all committed to do our best to ensure appropriate class sizes uh, within the resources we have. Uh, and then I believe I may have spoken to the same person as Ms. Mainville around the health and physical education um, uh, policies and curriculum and so on and so forth. And I'd just add that, you know, they, it, it, it feels like, and I, you know, that, um, we want to have a driving force, is, is this person's thought, throughout the district on how we do health and physical education, um, much like we do in an English curriculum or a math curriculum. And what we hear also from um, those parents passionate about music, to have a driving force behind the music curriculum. Again, all subject to resources. Um, so I just want to emphasize what Ms. Mayville said there. Uh, those were the big things I heard uh, this past month. Thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald. Now, Ms. Hill. Good evening, Madam 
Madam Chair, members of the school committee, and Superintendent Powers. Um, I'm going to do my personnel report. Um, the dates are from December 9th, 23, through January 19th, 2024. Um, in the past month, we've had three resignations, um, eight new hires, one rehire, and two reassignments. Assignments um, voluntary? Yes, voluntary. And my second question was that during a previous school committee meeting, a couple of the, the school committee members expressed that their concerns about using teacher and demographics to track district progress towards our goal of diversifying um, staff. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions on another way to track our progress towards diversifying our staff? Well, I have suggestions. We're working actually on some um, initiatives right now. Um, we are signed up for three different job fairs right now to try to diversify our staff. So I have um, Stonehill College coming up in February, and uh, then the Merck job fair that's at U, um, that's in April, and then the local BSU one. Um, they're also looking for others that may be coming around to try to diversify. right now what we're doing, so um, they're I'm talking with my team and with the superintendent about also doing a um, uh, fair right in um, for VR, right right in VR to try to um, <coughs> have students who are maybe students at BSU or other places that are close to this one come and see what we're all about right there in one of our buildings. So that's something I'm thinking about right now. So that's amazing. It sounds like you're going to be on the road quite a bit. <laughs> I'm excited for that. Um, how will you track progress? So if we're not going to look at the demographic shift, how will we show that those steps that you've taken and invested your time and energy into has yielded positive results if we don't look at the demographics? So, I mean, while we're looking at just re like reaching out to the different populations at these different job fairs, um, we're doing what what we did when we were, you know, trying to find jobs, um, get, getting those resumes, uh, outreaching to everyone that we meet, staying connected, um, offering assistance for, you know, if we have positions, showing them where our websites are, giving them a QR code, keep checking back. Um, you know, we have our website that we can do some data, uh, but it's not, but we can do some like analytics on. But it's not, you know, it's not cool. So it's hard to tell. Um, but we're, you know, we keep reaching out and participating in different um, events that we can and trying to get on um, the, uh, I think I'm going to forget the acronym right now, but um, MPDE. Um, we're not accepting applications right now to be part of that group. So I'm um, really pushing for that for next year. January 10th, during the early release time, uh, the district held its first staff wellness fair. Uh, as a committee, you know that one of our four um, pillars of our student success plan is focused on human capital. One focused area within the pillar is promoting staff wellness and opportunities across the district, so initiatives across the district. This event allowed us to do just that. We were able to recognize the efforts of our amazing staff by providing optional wellness experiences and activities for their enjoyment. By offering this specific event during the in-service, it allowed a large number of staff to participate in the opportunity. There are planned activities and classes for staff to participate in. Some of these activities and classes included mini CPR and first aid training, mindfulness and meditation, a guided run and a guided walk, chair massages and pet therapy brought to us by our community partner, Plymouth County Canine. That was probably one of my favorites. Everyone said that, but anyway. Um, other partnerships to thank for their involvement included Chartwells, Bridgewater Fire Department, 
Greenham Fire Department, Harborville from Healthcare, and their Living Well Division, Plymouth County Retirement, Altus Dental, Boston Mutual, Horace Mann, Equitable, LPL Financial, Physical Therapy U, YMCA, ASD Fit, and the Boundless Bean. Of course, we couldn't do any of this without our amazing staff behind the scenes and those who were there that day to help volunteer for the event. The feedback has been overwhelmingly positive and we're really looking forward to the next one we can have. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I would just like to thank you, Ms. Healy, and all of the staff that brought this to the staff at the district. I've heard from different staff of how positive it was and um, what a great event it was, and I just, I think everybody and their hard work and pulling this together for this staff. Thank you. Um, sure. this is, I just want to reiterate that I've had it from several staff members that they really enjoyed it, and I think focusing on that is just as important as the day for Google training or some curriculum training. Like, if the staff is feeling taken care of, they're going to be more apt to feel more connected. So I think that was a great idea. see some pictures online, right? I think they were shared on the district page. It looks like a good time. I would definitely like the dog piece too. How often are you guys looking? Like, is this like a once a year type thing? Multiple times a year? Or I think one time a year for a big event like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, working with some folks at a central office to send out a survey to see what people are looking for. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I love camaraderie after work hours. Um, I would love to see some things happen, like a uh, walking club, um, you know, we could get some teams together for maybe some friendly kickball or something like that. If that's what the staff wants, I'll do whatever the staff wants. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to um, get behind what they would like. I can see that getting really to the kind of verbal feedback, did, was there any kind of um, uh, matrix or survey or anything? The survey, we're working on it right now okay. to go out the survey to get some idea of what people would like or if they didn't choose to attend, um, what they did cho chose to do with their time um, instead. Um, a lot of you know people came and went and, and um, I did have a registration table so I had uh, about 200 people registered to come in that were in the building that day for the event. I did have a pre-registration kind of just to see what people would be interested in. So I knew that the numbers were gonna be higher than I kind of expected for the first one. Um, I think that you know timing for the next one, I'd try to extend it a little bit on the other end if possible. So those little things like that, I think we could tweak and make it a lot better, um, but it was really, I think for the people who came out and really had um, had a, a time to go through and maybe do an event, do the meditation and mindfulness, that um, that was a real big draw. And that was um, I'm not sure how many people ended up going into it, but I saw a lot of people bringing their yoga mats and really like looking forward to that. And even the guided run and walk had a lot of people, and um, I had some great support there. That um, between our admin staff and um, staff from Central Office who came out and helped. So it was really a lot of fun. I think everyone had a good time. But I think just keep the momentum going and um, showing that, you know, that wellness matters to all of us. Because it's not just the words and it's not just under our, our pillar, but it really is something that's meaningful to everyone. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're, you're measuring the success of the event by the attendance of, so there, there, there were different stations and depending on the volume of folks that took advantage of that, that will help you to understand what was successful and maybe help you inform what you bring forward the next time? Yes, I think uh, just seeing what, if there, maybe if we missed something. So that will be one of the questions. If, you, if there was something there that, or something that you didn't see that you would like, um, all the people that I mentioned, all those partnerships, every single one of them are there at our event, at, they had their own tables. Um, a lot of them donated raffle prizes. Um, they told me, these these our partners told me this was the best event they've ever been to. So for to hear that 
at this time, I will ask Mr. Collins to give his um, presentation on the budget. If the committee members want to move to the audience. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the school committee. Uh, I am here tonight to present the uh, fiscal year 25 preliminary budget. I did want to start by thanking uh, the administrative team that's here. I see we have members of the community uh, as well, so thank you for attending. And lastly, I'd like to recognize and acknowledge our town officials from both the town of Bridgewater and Rainham. Uh, your presence here obviously communicates that you are a strong partner and ally to the district and that you are invested in the success of our students. So thank you, I truly appreciate it. Just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to discuss tonight, obviously I want to uh, provide you with some context on the district, who we are, what we're about, um, talk a little bit about the budget process, how the budget process, uh, the timeline of the budget process, and how the uh, budget is actually developed. Uh, obviously we'll, we'll dive into the FY25 preliminary budget, discuss next steps, and then end with some acknowledgements and certainly open it up to questions. So the district, just to give a quick overview of the district, as you know, we uh, have eight schools and seven school buildings serving, uh, based on our October 1 numbers, 5,582 students in pre-K through 12 plus. We are the second largest regional school district in the Commonwealth. I think that's something that uh, obviously we take great pride in, uh, but it's significant as well. Uh, when you think of being the second largest regional school district across the state, that's no small, no small feat. I did provide a quick overview and a snapshot of the district and the demographics and the makeup of our students. Uh, you can see on the left hand side, obviously the various um, uh, categories there and then obviously the subgroups um, of our students on the right. I do think it's important to note that you know, when you look back to say even FY24, uh, obviously the majority of those categories have increased. Uh, you know, the percentage of students that, uh, you know, for example, are first language, not English, we're up to 6.6% this year. Last year was 6.1%. When you look at five years ago, we were at 2.7%. Uh, so again, significant increases. Uh, when you look at our students with disabilities, uh, last year we were at 19.1%, now we're at 19.9%. Uh, five years ago, we were at 16.2%. Uh, when you look at the demographics of our district, uh, African American, uh, you can see uh, that we're at uh, roughly 11 a little over 11%. Uh, last year we were at 10.3, and five years ago we were at 5.2%. Uh, so the, the district is, is always changing and evolving, uh, which I think is great. Uh, anytime our demographics change, I think it's an opportunity for us to celebrate and recognize that, that our towns are changing and our students are changing. And that's a good thing. Uh, but you can see here, obviously, the different categories, and, and I think you understand by now, but certainly happy to give a quick overview uh, when we look at some of these uh, different categories, such as first language, not English, I think that's you know fairly self-explanatory. Um, English, so a, a family has you know identified that their first language primarily spoken at home is not English. Uh, English language learner, uh, so a student that has been identified requiring additional support uh, with uh, English language acquisition. Uh, obviously, students with disabilities, so our students that uh, have any type of physical cognitive uh, disability uh, and that are on an IEP. High needs. The high needs category is really a combination of, of those different subgroups. So looking at our English language learners, our students with disabilities, and then our low income students. Uh, low income, uh, if you've been around and, and have kind of seen different budget presentations, is uh, it's not fairly new, uh, but it's actually uh, been brought back. The state had originally classified students as low income, 
and then switched to economically disadvantaged, and now they're categorizing students again as low income. This is an overview of our enrollment trends. Uh, you can see, obviously, again, you know, I tried to go uh, even the last few years. You can see our enrollment continues to increase, and I, I think that's also important to note when you actually, you know, speak to other districts across the state, or, or certainly you see this on the news. Some districts are experiencing enrollment trends going in the other direction, that they're actually decreasing enrollment. Uh, when we came out of COVID, we actually saw uh, just the opposite of that, that our enrollment has started to increase. Uh, and here it is. Uh, so you can see, so you can see the uh, blue, the dark blue bar, that represents our student population. Uh, the light blue uh, section of the bar represents our staffing. And then obviously I included also the percentage of our high needs students, which I just spoke to you about. Uh, just some changes to point out, you can see when we go back to say 2012, 2013, you know, our high needs population was at 29% of our student, overall student population. You can see we're now at 40%. Uh, so again, you know, as those needs increase, uh, certainly uh, it comes with that additional support that sometimes, sometimes is needed. Uh, staffing, uh, you can see obviously we've, we've added staff over the years. Uh, when I look back historically, I know this question came up in terms of, um, you know, just in the past, has staff been higher, has staff been lower? Uh, I would say staff was pretty consistent around the 330 number. I know there were certainly years where uh, it, it was a little bit less, especially the years that we had uh, layoffs, but it's held pretty consistent uh, for the fact around 325 to 330. And you can obviously see, uh, see back in fiscal year 23, uh, due to uh, the good financial state of both the states, uh, both the state and the towns were able to add additional positions. Uh, that was obviously the first year of the Student Opportunity Act, which resulted in additional funding for districts across the state. So we were able to reap those benefits and add additional staff from uh, fiscal year 22. Uh, we've obviously, obviously been able to maintain that staff uh, for this year as well. Um, I do want to point out that with this number, the 5,582 numbers based on our October 1, Enrollment, um, and actually speaking with uh, Meg about our recent enrollment, uh, when you look even from October 1 until now, when I was working on uh, preparation and this number probably has even gone up, we've actually had an increase of 98 students just from October 1 until now. Uh, when you think of 98 students, you know, that's really the equivalent of almost four classrooms. And we've added, we haven't added any additional staff at this time. This is, this is you know, really, who we are and what we're about. Uh, obviously, you can see our mission, and you've heard me say this several times over and over again. We're all about excellence in education for all. Uh, we, we don't just talk it, I believe we walk it, and everything that we do uh, is based on that. You can see our vision for our students and for our district, and then obviously our equity statement, the fact that we are really committed to providing uh, you know, equitable opportunities to our students throughout the district, and, and obviously to our families. Uh, this budget, obviously the FY25 budget and all previous budgets and really everything we do here in the district is based on our student success plan, which is our strategic plan. Uh, the strategic plan or the student success plan is based on the planning for success model uh, that has been published by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. We actually started uh, trans uh, transforming into the student success plan uh, five years ago, or really six years ago, I guess at this time when we were developing it. Uh, we did have a consultant from DESE come in uh, walk us through this process, and I think it's been very beneficial for us to uh, have one clear, succinct plan. Uh, so as you uh, have heard already, uh, the plan is based on four pillars, safe and supportive schools, so making sure that our students are not just physically safe, physically safe at school, but also socially, emotionally safe. Uh, obviously, curriculum, uh, instruction, and um, uh, technology and assessment, that's, that's everything that we're, we're about, right? That, that's what drives us, that's really why we're here to provide and education to our students. Uh, obviously operations, uh, you know, having great facilities, technology, uh, budgetary systems, and you've already heard about human capital. It really is important to invest in, in the people that we have, uh, our staff, our great staff, and obviously the staff that we hope to bring in. Just to give you a quick overview of the budget process, we actually started uh, somewhat earlier this year than, than normal. Uh, Ms. Babalola and I actually talked to our administrative team this summer in August. Uh, we typically don't start until September, October, uh, but we really wanted to have a, an initial conversation with our administrative team as early as possible, and that's kind of the first time we come together. So we really started talking about 
what FY25 may look like. Um, and so I, I think you know, starting that early uh, certainly behooves us. Uh, but obviously here we are in January, uh, so here I am to present the preliminary budget uh, to the school committee, to the community. Uh, then we'll transition over to March where there will be a public hearing in the beginning of March and then the school committee later that month will vote to adopt uh, the FY25 budget. And then from there, obviously, uh, the budget will be sent to the towns uh, later on in the spring and in, in May, uh, where the Bridgewater Town Council and the Marineham Town Meeting will vote to approve funding uh, for the school budget for FY25. And shortly thereafter, we will begin the process all over. So just wanted to give a quick overview, and, and I certainly won't spend too much time unless there's questions on this about the budget process and how the budget is really developed. Uh, you, you, you've heard uh, and you'll continue to hear about Chapter 70 funding. Chapter 70 is really the main funding mechanism from the Commonwealth. Uh, it's their program for ensuring adequate and equitable pre k 12 education <coughs> funding. It determines an adequate spending level for each school district, which is also referred to as the foundation budget. It determines an adequate spending level. I'm sorry, it then uses each community's property values and residents' incomes to determine how much of the foundation budget should be funded from local property taxes. And then Chapter 70 state aid makes up the difference. So you have the foundation budget, they determine what the communities can contribute, and then the state makes up the difference. So obviously that foundation budget is key uh, for us to really know uh, what is expected, not just of the district, but of the towns, and what we can then expect from the state for, uh, for funding. <coughs> You know, obviously, you can see there that you know uh, Chapter 70 is our main uh, funding source. Chapter 71 is also uh, another funding source from the state. That's our transportation reimbursement, and that varies uh, from year to year in terms of what we can expect for transportation reimbursement. Regional transportation at one time was promised about 100% reimbursement. I don't, I don't think we've ever actually ever seen that. Some years it's been more. Um, the last couple of years we've teetered around 90. Uh, this past year is about 79%. And then before that, anywhere from the 60s to 70s to the low 80s. Uh, obviously, local contributions, that's the, the towns, uh, what they are con contributing to the budget. And that, you know, there's a minimum number established by the state that both towns have to contribute. I, I do want to point out and, and obviously recognize and thank the towns. Uh, they actually always, uh, have always contributed over uh, what the required amount is. And I think that's important to, to know and, you know, show that they're committed uh, to the district supporting us as much as possible. And then obviously the district contributes as well uh, based on fees that we're able to generate through uh, rental of our facilities, activities, athletics. Uh, we obviously receive Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, any type of interest earned on, on our accounts, you heard uh, you know, from uh, about Ms. Robichaud investing our money in, in different bank accounts. Obviously miscellaneous receipts, if we, um, you know, uh, an item uh, that was originally supposed to cost uh, X amount, it turns out it was less. Uh, but they were reimbursed. Uh, circuit breaker reimbursements uh, for special education costs. And then we also use funds from e what we refer to as E&D or excess and <coughs> You said you were entertaining questions from that slide? Uh, I can take the questions now or if you want until the end. Uh, it's up to you, what would you prefer? Why don't we sure, wait until the end? Why we the end? Okay. So okay. go back. So this is just a, a kind of a historical snapshot of our funding uh, over the last few years. Uh, you can see, obviously, it breaks down Chapter 70, Chapter 71, uh, what the contributions from the town of Bridgewater have been, the town of Rainham, and then the district to give you a subtotal of our operating costs. And then, obviously, to show historically what we've uh, you know, sent or spent on capital and debt. And then the total budgets as well. Uh, and obviously, as I, I shared, uh, you know, certainly, both towns have contributed uh, more than the required amount, which, which we're grateful for. Uh, we have benefited the last couple of years from Chapter 70, uh, increases in Chapter 70 through the Student Opportunity Act, uh, anywhere from you know 12 to 18 percent increases in Chapter 70. When you look over the four-year period, uh, approximately we, we received about a 36 percent increase in Chapter 70, which is which is significant. Uh, numbers were released early today. Uh, I don't think we're going to be uh, in, in such receive such a beneficial amount uh, that we have in the past. Uh, the governor shared that she anticipated about a 4% increase in Chapter 70 funding overall. When we look at early uh, numbers from the state, we're, we're at about a 1.7% increase
weeks over the last year. Uh, but as I said, those numbers were released this afternoon, so we really haven't uh, reflected any of those uh, any of those amounts in the uh, <coughs> report this evening, which obviously we will once we have a chance to digest all of that. So the preliminary budget is obviously based on our student success plan. Uh, we have asked, or I've asked, all building and district administrators to propose personnel, goods, and services that, are, that support our student success plan and our path to excellence. And obviously, this budget is reflective of our commit, collective commitment to for uh, excellence in education for all students. Uh, obviously, going into this, uh, we knew that we more than likely wouldn't have our most up-to-date information uh, in terms of funding. Uh, as I stated, we do have that information for this afternoon. I think it's important to note, though, that you know when we look at our student success plan, obviously it's a five-year plan. The number that you'll see uh, coming up is really reflective of that five years. So it, it, it's you know it, in some cases maybe a significant increase, but it really is showing what we need in order to fulfill our student success plan. And if that happens in one year, that's great. If it happens over the course of the next five years, uh, so be it. But I think it, it gives a snapshot to both communities and the community at large really what we. So when we do talk about budget, the budget is developed and, and presented tonight by series. Uh, so you can see on the left-hand column, you have the, the, what we refer to as the 1,000 series, the 2,000 series, the 3,000 series, and so forth. I do want to point out, uh, I did not, uh, I tip, well, I intentionally skipped 6,000. I didn't leave it off. We actually don't have uh, any categories of the 6,000. 6,000 is community services, so if we were to provide community services, uh, such as uh, health services to the community, I know some, uh, you know, districts offer dental clinics, health clinics, uh, you know, so those types of things, civic activities, recreation activities provided by the district. That would be in the 6,000 series because we don't do that. Obviously, we don't include that in our budget. Uh, but just to give you a quick overview, you can see, uh, and I won't read each one, you can see it up there, uh, really what each category consists of. So administration, if you think of it overall, it really is central office, superintendent's office, the business office, uh, IT. Instructional services, uh, that's the backbone of the district. So that is all of our uh, supplies and materials, instructional materials, and then obviously the majority of our uh, teaching and learning staff. 3,000 series of the school uh, services. Uh, transportation is factored into that. Our nursing department as well, food services, athletics, extracurriculars, and so forth. Operations and maintenance, I think again, that's self-explanatory. Uh, our facilities and maintenance and, and such. Fixed costs, uh, that's obviously uh, health insurance uh, for active and retired employees. Capital, uh, as you can imagine, those are, those are capital expenses, so if we're purchasing uh, goods uh, or equipment, uh, any type of uh, large purchase, whether it be land, uh, materials, uh, technology, and such. And then obviously debt retirement services, any type of construction related, remodeling, uh, new construction, uh, purchase of land, anything to actually borrow for, that would fall into that category. And then programs at other schools, uh, that's related to obviously our tuitions with uh, other schools, uh, special education tuition for out of district students, residential, uh, and such. So what you'll see here is obviously the, the budget presented by categories, and I'll go into more detail by category in the, in the next uh, few slides. You can see in overall how it compares, obviously in the right hand, far right hand column, you see FY25 initial. So that is our preliminary budget. That is reflective of all of the personnel, goods, and services that we asked our building and uh, district administrators to submit. You can see what was approved in FY24 and FY23, just to have a sense of you know, where we're at. But again, I'll go into greater detail. Uh, just to kind of give you a quick overview, uh, this is uh, roughly a you know 16% increase from from last year. Uh, when we look back to the last uh, few years, uh, FY24 is 5.7% increase from the year before, and FY23 was a 7.4% increase from uh, the year before. Uh, when you look at operational expenses, obviously overall uh, the total amount, the bottom total budget, uh, similar numbers but slightly different, about a 15% increase, 5.6, 6.7. When you look at you know really what makes up the majority of our budget, as you can imagine, uh, being a, a very personnel-driven uh, organization, is salaries. Uh, so really, when we look at our operational budget, 
uh, about 75% of our budget is made up of salaries. Not just teacher salaries, but any salary, whether it be an administrator, central office, uh, school personnel, uh, any salary that uh, we pay out uh, accounts for about 75% of our budget. So I just wanted to kind of go by series and show you uh, really what the difference is. So what I've tried to do is show you from FY25 initial compared to FY24 approved in each one of these categories. So you can see for 1,000 series administration, again, looking at central office, uh, the different uh, superintendent's office, business office, and IT. Uh, obviously, we've increased our budget by approximately $145,000. Uh, you can see uh, we did propose one additional human resources department, specifically tied to our human capital uh, filler. And we obviously increased our technology infrastructure by approximately $100,000. So you have an understanding there of, of why that difference. The 2000 series, obviously instructional services, as I've shared with you, uh, this is where the majority of our um, expenses do come from. Uh, you can see that we have increased, uh, uh, the proposed budget with an increase of about $8 million. Uh, what factors into that $8 million? Obviously any type of contractual obligations that we have to uh, budget for, so if, you know, obviously we have uh, four different unions, we have to make sure that any type of pay increase is calculated in the budget or potential future uh, pay increases are calculated in, so we do have those contractual obligations. Uh, if you remember, the original budget that was proposed for FY24 uh, had to be reduced, so we uh, had to, uh, this budget is reflective of restoring about $1 million that we had cut from originally FY24 to get to the uh, necessary number, so this is reflective of bringing that $1 million worth of supplies and materials back. Uh, so curriculum resources, and then everyday resources, whether it be paper, pencils, uh, and so forth. Uh, obviously, professional development and training. Uh, you heard, obviously, we have a strong commitment to our staff. We want to make sure that we're providing uh, every opportunity for professional development and training. Uh, continue to purchase high-quality instructional materials. Uh, thankfully, the school committee and the towns, uh, through their funding in the state, uh, we've been able to add high quality instructional materials across the district and we continue to do so. Uh, we really kind of started the last couple of years looking at uh, really the middle grades and now we've started to expand uh, in either direction. Uh, the high school started to roll out some new curriculum materials this year. We hope to be able to do uh, additional materials at the high school for next year. And then obviously uh, we continue to roll out uh, new programming at the elementary level working our way down. Uh, obviously, as you know, the district has rolled out a one-to-one -one Chromebook program. So again, we have to, uh, you know, replenish those Chromebooks each year. I know Mr. Schantz has done an amazing job of trying to secure grant funding when possible to try to offset the operational budget so that we don't have to absorb all those costs. Uh, all those costs. But when we're looking at uh, you know, budgeting for Chromebooks, uh, you know, we typically look at anywhere from three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand uh, per year just to be able to replace. As you know, when students come in as freshman year. The high school, they receive a Chromebook. When students enter fifth grade, they receive a Chromebook to use for the next four years. And then we obviously want to be able to replace uh, our Chromebooks at the elementary level. Uh, we have cards for every other classroom uh, that they share. Chromebooks, uh, as great as they are, uh, they do have somewhat of a shelf life. Um, I know Mr. Schultz tries to typically anticipate about a you know, three to five year shelf life, five kind of being on the high end, where uh, many of those programs uh, or the Chromebooks won't handle the updates that are necessary. We find that especially at the high school, middle school level, and even elementary with MCAS testing. Every time the state, uh, the test nav system that we use for MCAS, every time they release an update, we have to make sure that the Chromebooks that we're currently using can actually handle those updates. And then what you'll see, obviously, the, the biggest uh, increase here is uh, additional positions. Uh, and through our district and building administrators, uh, we have proposed 60 additional positions approximately $4.2 million. And I'm going to kind of go over what those positions are just so you have a sense. Uh, you can obviously see right here uh, how I tried to set this up is what the positions were that are being requested or proposed, the alignment with the student success plan, and then were these positions previously requested in a prior budget. Uh, so we'll start with our interventionists. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, we currently have interventionists in the district. Uh, however, they are funded through ESSER, our ESSER grants, uh, currently right now through ESSER 3. Uh, and unfortunately, ESSER 3 and all of the COVID-related funding 
is uh, uh, finishing up at the end of, of this year. It expires in, in September, uh, but we certainly wouldn't uh, you know, wait until then. Uh, but so we, we do have several of these positions that are being funded by ESSER uh, grant funding, uh, and we've come to realize that these positions are really valuable to us, and we'd love to be able to not just keep what we have, but also increase the number of interventionists that we have. So we're looking at approximately 13 interventionists. Really, uh, every school uh, would have at least one, if not more, depending on enrollment. Uh, and again, I think if you were to ask the principals, they would attest how important these positions are. Uh, we've also, and this was something that we requested uh, to move into the operational budget last year. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that, so that funding, uh, the funding for those positions did remain with the uh, ESSER grants. Uh, the English learner teacher, um, I, I think you know, you've obviously heard us talk about uh, not just our, our newcomers uh, that enrolled with us recently, uh, but when we look at enrollment overall and for our English language learners, that population is uh, increasing significantly. Uh, I think you know, when we look at, say, even compared to last year, um, I know to start the year we were plus 50, Ms. Richards, and then even from there, uh, I think you know, plus our new students, and we've had probably another 20 on top of that. So we're, we're probably about a plus 100 almost from last year at this time. Again, adding no new additional staffing to support those. We currently do have one posting out there for an English learning teacher to be able to, to provide additional uh, support. Our teacher at the high school right now has uh, approximately 60 students on her caseload, uh, and that certainly is just not uh, manageable. Uh, one, not just for her, but you know what type of uh, instruction and support are the students actually getting. And then when you look at our other uh, English learning teachers, you know, they're anywhere from 20 to 30 uh, on their caseloads right now. So we want to make sure that we can add additional staff to provide the necessary support to our students and help them achieve the uh, English language. Uh, for special education teachers, again, this was previously um, requested. Uh, we're looking right now at, obviously, caseloads across the district. And so where those four special education teachers um, will, will finally land uh, is somewhat to be determined. We want to make sure that as uh, certain groups move through the grade levels that we can continue to support them. So if we have a certain uh, grade level with a high number of special education students, uh, we want to make sure that we can reallocate staff if necessary. Uh, I know we've also talked about trying to address the special education model uh, currently at the high school and uh, again, you know, planning for uh, any unforeseen uh, increases. You know, we've had some internal conversations already about potential of needing another substantial separate classroom. So we want to make sure that we are prepared for that. Uh, I think you know the other thing that I, I really want to, uh, and you'll, you'll see some of our requests are focusing on special education. I, I think it's important to, to note, and I think uh, Mr. Fitzgibbons, you had said something similar to this at one point, so hopefully I'm quoting you accurately. You know, we as a district uh, are really judged by how we treat and educate our most vulnerable students. I think we, you know, showing up there that we really have a commitment to our students. We want to make sure that the students that are vulnerable world and, and more at risk are receiving that support. And along those lines, uh, we don't want to just make sure that we're, you know, providing that support. We want to make sure we're in compliance. Uh, obviously, our special education students and, and our English learners, uh, they, you know, come with a lot of, um, uh, their, their education comes with a lot of federal regulations that we have to operate under. And there are times where, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's a compliance issue, and you know, making sure that we have the right ratios to support the students. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're working with families, that we can meet the timelines that are have been established. And when we don't, unfortunately, uh, when we have compliance issues, that you know really destroys the family's trust in the district. And we want to make sure that we're providing not just for the students, but also for the families as well. So along those lines, uh, we've proposed one additional special education administrator. Specifically with a focus on early childhood, uh, I know right now that our preschool program uh, has grown significantly over the last couple of years and we continue to add students. We've already talked about um, we have a, a winter screening coming up and so we anticipate increased enrollment in preschool already uh, and we possibly need to add an additional class. So again, um, you know, Mr. Bray and Ms. Larkin and, and Ms. Joseph and, and Ms. Hart and, and the full team have done an amazing job of trying to oversee the preschool program within uh, the, Mitchell, the Mitchell Elementary. However, uh, that program really deserves its own administrator. Uh, again, not just for compliance reasons, but also to make sure that we are providing uh, you know, a, a program that's 
efficient and really providing the necessary supports uh, to our students. Uh, we're also proposing four special education team chairs. This is a new position, or these are new positions they have not been previously requested. Uh, really the hope here is that we would use these special education team chairs to really uh, help facilitate and run the team meetings that are taking place at all of our buildings. Uh, this position would uh, really be, you know, someone that has experience in the special education field. It could be certainly one of our uh, current special education teachers. It could be a school psychologist. Someone that is familiar with running uh, the team process. Again, we feel as though it's important to make sure that we are meeting all of the deadlines, uh, establish, you know, when the meeting has to take place, how many days from, uh, you know, notification that needs to go out, all of those. So it's not just compliance, but it's also looking at how we can better support our current staff. You know, right now we have, uh, many of our staff right now um, are required to uh, not just, you know, uh, provide support and interventions, uh, and specialized instruction, but they're also, uh, you know, they're responsible for doing the, the special education testing, report writing, and then some even on top of that are then required to actually run these, these team meetings. So I think this would just make us more efficient. Uh, we'd have greater oversight of, of you know, the, the timelines and deadlines and make us more compliant as well as being able to provide uh, additional support, not just to the students, but really these positions would be providing support to our staff. Uh, two ELA coaches, again, they, these were previously um, requested. Uh, we were able to uh, use some grant funding to uh, you know, support these positions this year. Uh, we have Title I funds. Uh, we also have some uh, early literacy uh, funds through the Student Opportunity Act that we were able to utilize to, to have our ELA coaches, oh, we currently have five uh, this year. Four, 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 four this year, yes, and one math, thank you. Uh, so for ELA, uh, we'd like to be able to pr uh, propose uh, two additional. Uh, so you know, we'd love to be able to have all in the operational budget, but we know we probably still need to use grant funding to uh, support the three that we currently have. And uh, you know, we want to be able to add additional ones. Along those lines with our math coaches, again, we've been able to support the grant funding one math coach this year. As we rolled out our math program K-12, uh, we have had uh, significant uh, uh, feedback, uh, very powerful, positive feedback uh, along the lines of our math coach and the job that uh, she is doing. So again, just being able to provide additional support to our teachers who then uh, you know, have that direct touch point with our students. Nine classroom teachers, uh, and again, various levels. Uh, obviously, the focus here is not just providing additional opportunities to our students, but looking at class size as well. So when we look at the nine, uh, the nine classroom teachers that are proposed, we have currently two at the high school, one business teacher. We've seen a, a pretty significant growth in our business department. I think Ms. Watson will can attest to that. Uh, we're providing different offerings there over the last couple of years. We have been fortunate to add some staff there. Uh, but many of our students, I think, are engaged in, in that department. Uh, Ms. Moore is also uh, helping out with DECA and, and leading that, and I think that program is, is growing uh, quite significantly. And I think the competition might have actually been um, uh, decently, yes, uh, in, in our kids be great. So really, uh, we're seeing an increase there. Uh, we obviously uh, have already talked about the need for a civics-specific program at the high school. As you know, uh, we're required to offer a civics class at the middle school and high school level. Uh, currently, uh, that responsibility at the high school level is kind of uh, being absorbed in, in the different classes. Uh, they have to complete a civics project before they graduate, um, and the, the teachers in our history department uh, have taken on some of that responsibility. But as Ms. Watson proposed last year, as, as well as I did, uh, it would be great to have that civics teacher to be able to provide that. Um, you've, uh, you know three years ago, uh, we tried to increase the number of teams at Bridgewater Middle School. Uh, just for scheduling purposes and obviously class size purposes. Mr. Caleb currently has three teams in sixth grade, and so two years ago we sought to add three teams in seventh grade and three teams in eighth grade, so we always have a consistent number of uh, teachers feeding into the next grade. Uh, thankfully, uh, two years ago, uh, by the support of the school committee in the town, we were able to add an additional team at Bridgewater Middle School. However, last year we proposed uh, to add an additional team in eighth grade, and unfortunately the budget was not able to support that. So we are back here again to uh, request the addition of a team at Bridgewater Middle School, which would be three additional teachers. Um, Ms. Charette at RMS has re, uh, requested, uh, again, to help with class size, two additional teachers. Um, tentatively scheduled right now for fifth grade to seventh grade based on a projected enrollment. 
And then we've also uh, afforded, uh, uh, requested two elementary teachers again to address class size, looking specifically where uh, bubbles may exist. So that's an overview of those nine positions. Uh, we've also uh, requested one additional high school music teacher. Uh, obviously, you know, our, our band, our chorus, our music offerings are expanding. Our students are doing an amazing job. But we know if we truly want to expand those programs, uh, if we can support that financially, uh, that uh, we, you know, we truly believe we build that they will come, and that's what we've tried to do. We've added, again, thanks to the school committee and support of the towns, we've been able to increase our staffing at the middle school level uh, in terms of what we're able to offer in terms of band and course uh, the last couple of years. And what we want to be able to do is maintain that momentum. I think Ms. Charette and Mr. Caleb will tell you uh, the numbers at the middle school level have grown. Uh, and it's such a positive, positive outcome but we want to make sure that now when those students get to high school, they actually have the same opportunities. And currently, only with one teacher, we can't necessarily support that. Uh, we've also proposed uh, two unified art teachers for the middle school. Again, uh, kind of exactly what that unified art will be uh, is to be determined. As you know, we, we've discussed offering uh, potentially foreign language at the uh, middle schools. And we've also talked about uh, you know, the continuance of expanding health. I think when you look at some of our unified arts class sizes at the middle school, uh, you know, additional staff, especially at that level, is certainly warranted. Uh, 16 ESP, so educational support professionals. Um, as you know, we asked for um, additional ESPs last year. Uh, two years ago, we were able to add one ESP to every kindergarten classroom. Last year, we tried to replicate that model for first grade, and unfortunately, we weren't able to support that, but here we are again requesting the same thing. Uh, I think when you look at the requirements put forth by the state in terms of early literacy assessments, the amount of screenings that we have to do, um, and the required small group, uh, when you look at some of the, the screenings in terms of uh, identifying or potentially identifying students as uh, having dyslexia, you know, that requires a lot of small group intervention and remediation uh, you know, with our higher class size. And certainly that additional support in those classrooms will be able to help and provide that. I think it's also worth noting, um, you know, when you look at uh, kind of our return on investment, uh, thankfully the school committee, again, the support of the towns, uh, we were able to add additional positions to kindergarten. When Ms. Richards and Ms. Joyce and I uh, take a look at the data, the achievement data of our kindergarten students compared to pre-ESPs uh, in, in the classrooms, uh, it's significant. Uh, you know, we have been able to reduce the amount of students at risk. Um, when you compare, say, this time of year, winter to winter, prior to us having ESPs, uh, you know, you're talking about a significant difference from, for example, uh, one of the elementary schools said about 60% of our students in the at-risk category, I think we reduced that down to about 30? 20. So, you know, again, a significant decrease. What has changed? Obviously, um, you know, our teachers are amazing, so that certainly contributes to it. Uh, we've also been able to provide them high-quality instructional materials, but I do really believe uh, one of the other deciding factors there is the fact that we've been able to add additional support. So again, we're requesting additional ESPs for first grade, as well as uh, some additional ESPs district-wide to support our special education classrooms. Uh, one special education secretary uh, to help out in the special education department. Uh, this again is making sure that we are compliant in terms of getting reports out to parents in a timely fashion, getting those back and processing those IEPs uh, through our digital program. Again, this position I think is, is necessary in order to make sure that we are compliant uh, under the laws and regulations of special ed. Uh, we're proposing two additional assistant principals, uh, both at the elementary level. Uh, one is for the Rainham Elementary. When I say Rainham Elementary, as you currently know, we have one assistant principal that's split between La Liberty and Merrill. Uh, so this would be an, uh, a reoccurring request where we uh, would advocate for additional assistant principal on the Rainham side, so we would have one at each school, and then an additional uh, assistant principal at the Mitchell Elementary. When you look at the Mitchell uh, Elementary, it's obviously one of our largest be a, behind the high school. Uh, it has 1,000 plus students with only two administrators, so we really would advocate uh, for additional support there as well. Uh, one proctor, uh, this proctor currently uh, is scheduled to be uh, for the high school to assist with uh, the daily operations and, and security. Uh, I know Ms. Watson has uh, spoken in the past, and we've shared that obviously, uh, you know, the high school is a big building. We want to make sure we have adequate staff there, not just to oversee day-to-day -day operations and assist with those, but obviously potentially uh, after hours as well. 
and then one technology integration specialist. You know, we have made a significant uh, investment in technology across the district. Mr. Schatz and his department have done an amazing job uh, putting devices uh, in the hands of teachers. We want to make sure those teachers feel supported in using those devices. So again, uh, bringing back that technology integration specialist position that existed at one time in the district. Uh, 3000 series other school services. Uh, so transportation increase. Uh, you can see uh, approximately about two, a little over two million dollars. Uh, majority of that is transportation. Obviously, there's other increases, just the rate of inflation. Um, increases on other goods and services in the 3000 series. But the majority of that is us increasing our transportation line. Uh, obviously, there's an increase in the contract with uh, Lucini bus line, so we have to uh, you know, account for that. Uh, but we're also wanting to make sure that we are budgeting as accurately as possible. However, we also want to make sure that we're anticipating additional enrollments. Uh, you know, Ms. Hart, obviously, in her department, tried to anticipate that we may have additional students move in especially in the special education umbrella that may require transportation either in district or out of district. Uh, however, that is sometimes a moving target. Even though we anticipate on having additional students, we never really know the, the true number. And so this uh, increases, I think, reflective of us trying to anticipate what a real actual number might be. I, I know I shared this with budget sub, but just even looking at the beginning of this year, uh, we approximately uh, just in district vans had to increase the number of in district vans, uh, which was uh, almost $200,000 just since the beginning of the school year that we didn't necessarily uh, anticipate, but because there was that need, we had to do that. When we look at some of our new students that have moved in and the cost of transporting them out of the district, uh, that's also been a significant increase. I think we said six new students uh, in this heart just this year, uh, again, and, and you know, accounting for that. So factoring in those new students, factoring in the potential uh, that we may need to continue these two vans that we've added this year, and already in, in talking with Mr. Lucini, Ms. Babalolo and I went over there and reviewed the contract and what we can anticipate for next year. Uh, based on our increased enrollment, which you can probably anticipate this happening, we may need to add additional buses, which obviously would come at an additional cost uh, as well. So uh, to add a bus is, is approximately $100,000 a little, little less. Um, so when you factor in the increased vans, uh, the potential of a bus, our new students, you can see why we've increased transportation by uh, almost $2 million and also uh, to account for the increase in the contract. The 4000 series, operation and maintenance. So this is taking care of our buildings. Any type of preventative maintenance, any type of uh, additional maintenance, any type of reactive maintenance that we have to do. You heard Ms. King talk about a uh, heat pump that went down. That's not anticipated. Uh, so Mr. Kilgore and his department try to, again, anticipate those when he's building his budget. Uh, but we can't always 100% guarantee that uh, you know, we know what's going to be coming down uh, the road. However, that's why we try to be so proactive with preventative maintenance to make sure that our operating systems do last as long as possible uh, and that we are following the manufacturer's recommended uh, maintenance on these uh, equipment. Thankfully, we have uh, you know much of this we can do in-house because we do have our own maintenance staff. We have an electrician, a carpenter, a plumber. Uh, however, we do have to uh, you know, use outside vendors uh, for some of this uh, maintenance, preventive maintenance, reactive maintenance work, and uh, obviously there's an increase there. Uh, Mr. Kilgore is looking to increase uh, staffing in his department. We obviously want to make sure our buildings are uh, not just clean and healthy, but obviously uh, you know, operating as designed. So looking to add additional custodians, uh, looking to increase the maintenance staff to potentially uh, include a HVAC tech. That was a position that we had actually posted a number of years ago. <coughs> but unfortunately, at the time, we just we didn't uh, get any qualified candidates, if I remember, Mr. Kilgore. Uh, but we feel as though that of that position could then help offset some of this preventative uh, maintenance that we're paying to an outside vendor. That particular position could actually do uh, a lot of that maintenance, preventative and reactive as well. And then obviously some additional supervisory support from Mr. Kilgore. Uh, obviously Mr. Kilgore uh, tries to uh, split his time uh, between day and night and supervise all of our custodians and our maintenance staff. Uh, but certainly as that department increases uh, additional uh, support with the Uh, fixed costs, again, uh, the, the biggest driver here is health insurance. Uh, we anticipate for our active and retirees, health insurance to approximately increase by 1.2. Uh, we work with our insurance advisor. Uh, 
those official numbers have not been released, but uh, what they shared with, us that, shared with us is that we should anticipate about a 10% um, increase over last year. Uh, and that's what Ms. Davalola factored in when we were doing this. And obviously, other fixed costs, uh, the cost of inflation, are reflected in that other number. <coughs> Uh, program to go to schools, uh, as I shared with you in the beginning, uh, this is, again, tuition for uh, some of our special education students, uh, whether it be uh, either through a collaborative, uh, residential, a day program. Uh, as you know, last year, uh, the state had told us to anticipate a 14% increase uh, in special education tuition. Uh, so we uh, have budgeted and we haven't necessarily got uh, much clarification on what we should anticipate for this year. We try to budget as close to that as possible to make sure that um, you know, we are budgeting accurately, and especially if we have any, you know, as I already shared, six students move in. Capital costs. Um, and, and I should say that uh, obviously you'll notice these have been taken out of order. Uh, so those first uh, few series, those considered are what are, are considered what our operational costs are. Uh, the last, uh, through the budget development process, uh, both towns uh, actually approved them both on our capital and debt separately. So that's why uh, they were moved to the end. Uh, so what you just saw was really our operating budget. And now this is to talk about capital. Uh, these are the cap, just an overview of the capital projects. Uh, certainly we'll be sending more specific information to the towns on uh, exactly what these projects are. Uh, but you can see there was an increase of about $325,000. Obviously, HVAC maintenance and improvements, building security improvements, working on our exterior doors, camera system upgrades, uh, indoor and outdoor lighting projects. Uh, we are trying to, as much as possible, transition over to LED, uh, especially on the exterior of our buildings and the parking lots, and then certainly in, on the interior, especially in our larger spaces, auditoriums, cafeteria, gyms, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, we're always looking to improve our grounds. As you know, we've had several projects over the last couple of years for our athletic facilities. Uh, we have one additional request right now uh, from the athletics to look at the playing field at the high school for baseball and softball. Uh, specifically softball, uh, again, you know, new to me, so uh, I apologize if, if people are already aware of this. There's a certain type of infill that you need, uh, or a certain type of fill that you need on the infield in softball. Uh, and I guess what we have is, is pretty outdated, it's stone dust. So as our players are sliding or end up on the ground, it's basically like sliding on rocks. And they're you know, getting cuts and scrapes and uniforms are getting ruined. And so I guess there's a new and improved and updated uh, uh, fill that they would put in on the infield that are much uh, gentler on uh, our individual players. So that would be uh, one improvement, as well as parking lots. Um, I know I joked uh, with budget sub, if, you were, if anyone's thinking of starting a second business, I'm going to uh, pave it. Uh, certainly the cost to not just um, you know seal coat and, and uh, maintain the parking lots, but any type of new additional parking lots uh, is, is quite expensive. And then technology improvements uh, at the RMS Auditorium, uh, and obviously the high school, uh, high school uh, RMS Auditorium, looking at a new projector system um, and then the high school PA system as well. Uh, debt retirement services, we actually uh, are proposing from last year, which is great. I'm sure everybody loves to see that. Uh, the reason why is we actually had two of our bonds uh, had matured, so we're no longer required to pay that. And then we have three projects that their uh, outstanding debt is being reduced because of, you know, obviously it's coming uh, through maturity. Uh, and so we've been able to propose a reduction there. Just to give a, uh, again, a, a what's next. Uh, obviously, I think you've heard March 13th will be the public hearing on the FY25 budget. Uh, March 27th, the school committee will vote to adopt the FY25 budget. And then during the month of May, uh, the budget will be uh, taken up and hopefully approved by the Bridgewater Town Council and bring in the town meeting. And obviously, I, I think, and again, I spoke about this in the beginning, I think the sheer fact that uh, you know we have such a uh, diverse group in the audience between town officials, community officials, our community members and the school officials really speaks to our collective responsibility to make sure that we do meet our path to excellence. Um, I also wanted to, as I did kind of allude to it earlier, uh, certainly these numbers that you saw this evening are not reflective of what was released today in the government's budget. So we know that we uh, have some work to do in terms of refining what we're proposing tonight. However, what, as I stated in the beginning, what we're sharing tonight is 
what we feel as though that we need right now for personnel goods and services in order to fulfill our student success plan. Uh, and again, whether that happens uh, for next year for FY25 or over the course of the five year student success plan, uh, we will certainly be uh, most gracious either way. But I do think this is uh, really reflective of, of what our needs are as a district. Obviously there's uh, many individuals and too many to name, so I'll certainly uh, just uh, group them. Uh, Accordingly, I do want to thank the school committee. Obviously, we through the budget sub and the school committee all along. Uh, I know you are true champions of the district, so thank you. Uh, certainly, uh, we would not be here and have such a uh, solid budget presentation without Ms. Davalola, our director of business services, and Ms. Robichaud, our director. Uh, I have them on speed dial, talking multiple times a day, so I do appreciate their availability. Uh, obviously, I, I can't thank Mrs. Barry enough, the assistant superintendent, Ms. McDougall as well, uh, the executive assistant, and the entire um, administrative team for all your support. I do, uh, you know, and I, I think this is also worthy of, of pointing out, um, Ms. Babalola and I have had several meetings with town officials uh, from both the town of Bridgewater and town of Rainham going back to the summer. Uh, so these conversations about just our working relationship, our partnership, not just about the budget, but day-to-day -day operations, how we can become better partners and stronger partners. I have been going on for some time, so I want to thank, obviously, Mr. Dutton and Ms. Garini uh, from the Town of Bridgewater, as well as the, as the Town Council. Again, I appreciate your presence here. Uh, the Town of Rainham, Mr. Barnes, uh, Mr. Lavalette, the Finance Director, and then certainly the Board of Selectmen, uh, Mrs. Riley is here as well as uh, Dr. Krivendowski for the Finance, so I do appreciate your, your attendance here this evening. And I'm happy to, at uh, this point, entertain any questions that uh, I can have. Thank you. So I, I actually don't have that number for you tonight. Does it mean I can certainly get that to you? And um, as the slide that speaks to the budget process, where it talks about the state aid and the local contributions, um, for Chapter 70, are there any concerns about the gaps or short, shortfalls in the foundation budget compared to what the district actually needs? Like how close is our actual needs? to what they usually provide based on their formula. So I, I think, again, if you look at the last two years in terms of what we received, the, the increases from the prior fiscal years in Chapter 70, uh, I think the same, uh, what we were given, uh, certainly we were able to work uh, within those numbers. Uh, I, you know, I, I think uh, overall, would we love an, an increase in Chapter 70, 100%, sure, because that's our main funding source. I think when you look at, say, FY24, FY23, um, you know, there was a significant increase from the years prior. A lot of that had to do with uh, the state funding the Student Opportunity Act. When you look at what was uh, shared today, um, I do have concerns in terms of us being able to meet um, some of those gaps based on the formula um, and the preliminary number that was released today for Chapter 70. Just, so, Mrs. Mankel, I know I've, I've briefly looked at the numbers earlier today, so people understand the Chapter 70. It, it's only about a 1.7 increase this year. What came out today, again, it was released at like 1 or 2 o'clock this afternoon, um, so people haven't had a lot of time to digest it, but it's like $500,000 additional in increase than what was this past year. So it's a significantly lower percentage than we've received over the years. And 
so if I'm understanding what you're saying and what you said, Mr. Power, is that at, in years that you kind of work within the budget that they give you, so you don't necessarily have identified a gap between what the true needs are, you kind of just work with what they give you and reduce your needs? Well, yes, unfortunately our, our budget is driven by what the funding that we receive is. is. So our funding obviously comes from the, the state, through state aid, and then obviously through the towns. Uh, so we have to work within the confines of that funding. So when you put, do a proposal, it doesn't necessarily indicate what the needs are. It, it, your budget is based on what you anticipate receiving from the state and the local towns. Am I hearing that correctly? Uh, no, so actually the budget that you saw tonight was based on what our needs are, needs. not based on what the funding that we anticipate getting, uh, because we didn't know uh, because the information just came out today. So what we'll do then, um, well, we, I say uh, the budget sum uh, and uh, the business office and, and I will work through uh, what we anticipate now, now that we have more concrete numbers, we have a better sense of what the budget will actually look like. We'll have to start going through this and say, okay, based on that funding that we anticipate, what can be supported based on what you just saw for a proposal or what unfortunately needs to be eliminated and potentially asked for again in future years. So that helps. So how many times or over the past years have you had your budget, seen what the funding in is, and then adjusted it? I, I'm trying to understand the gap between what is the need. I, I think that's every, every year. year. Every, every okay, year. so every year. Every year. You're getting the the calculation that the state determines that you need is every year lower than what. The it's state. not just the state; it's, it's the different. towns right. too. You got to look at all three of them. Oh, I know, but I was focused just on Chapter Seven. So I, I, I would say, Mr. Mitchell, to that point, seven. when we look at what we proposed last year for a budget, uh, it was uh, the preliminary budget was approximately 104 million dollars. Again, kind of reflective of everything that we felt as though we needed at the time to be successful and, and fulfill our future student success plan. When we actually look at what we received, uh, obviously it was 94 million. So we knew that we, we had to reduce what we asked for by about $10 million. When you look at the years prior, uh, FY23 uh, and FY22, you know, there, there was an increase in Chapter 70 those years. Obviously there's a lot of additional funding given to districts by not just the federal but the state government because of COVID. So when we were asking for additional positions, uh, you know, there weren't many uh, in the FY23 uh, year that we uh, didn't put forward that we didn't actually get. Uh, again, you know, when looking back at those years, we weren't asking for 60 positions uh, because we were kind of doing a little bit different in terms of what do we need right now for next year versus what do we need to fulfill our five-year strategic plan. Um, so in terms of, you know, what the state and towns were able to support, say, two fiscal years ago uh, is, it was a little bit different uh, because of the funding that was available, not just by the towns, uh, but obviously by the state because of uh, the influx of COVID funding. But yes, typically what has happened is the number that we present during a preliminary budget like tonight it is uh, typically reduced uh, depending on how many positions have been asked for, uh, anywhere from you know five to 10 positions. If we've asked for 10, I would say on average we get anywhere from three to five on, a, on a, you know, a fairly good year. Um, so that kind of gives you, a, a, I guess, a, an indication of what we typically do. But yes, every year it's more than likely a reduction. Yeah. The next question is from, um, just to comment on that, so even for people that are in the audience or that may not be familiar with the budget process, really, this preliminary budget, as Mr. Powers eloquently put it, it's a needs-based budget the student success plan. If we receive the funding and we're able to fill all these positions, get all of these supplies and resources, this is what he thinks would be enough 
things like grants Danny brought up, just a quick question, because I know you can get back to a number that I definitely would be interested to. So like that staffing number is like the staff of the whole district and regardless of the <coughs> Uh, no, so that's reflective of uh, certified staff. Certified. So that when you look at our total staff uh, between uh, facilities, maintenance, yeah, administrators, uh, everybody, all we're uh, 600 plus. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is just like certified students, te I mean, yes. teachers. Yes. Okay. Yep. Teachers, right. school psychologists, school adjustment counselors, nurses, uh, anyone that's uh, really just, uh, you know, has a direct touch point with the student. Okay. Yeah, because it's just like really alarming because I think what in 2012. It was like 29 percent or shy of 30 for high needs, and it's mm -hmm. that's like 1,600 students, and we only went up from then. It's 400 students in total, but we went up 800 students in high needs. Yes, and we only went up 15 teachers. So it's yeah, um, just something to look at. Um, and in regards to. Um, now this is like. I mean, what you guys said about that it was like 60% when you added the ESP, before you added the ESPs, right? And then you went down to 20% and you're seeing that different? Uh, yes, at, at the early, uh, in kindergarten. Yeah. I think that's what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, so I mean, yep. I mean, I think that's huge. And obviously whatever we can do to maybe just keep at least the ESPs that you have, because I know we can't go up in grade, at like add it on the classrooms in the lower grades and right because we don't have the room. But just with the more students we have, I think just having that extra resources, I mean, it's whatever we can do to keep those. And I would also, just to your uh, point, Ms. Devport and Mrs. Um, Mainville, um, you know, if you all want to look uh, on Desi's website, actually gives the student to teacher ratio for all years, yes. and you can go back probably 15 years, and it's all there for every school within Reno and the district. Um, it's reported on the Desi website, and every district is across the state, and it actually, you can compare it to statewide also um, for student teacher ratio. Yeah, I guess my my biggest concern was like the high needs, the biggest jump right. in high needs, right. and then compared to yep. not as right. much yeah. teachers. And it also compares high needs percentage change. It gives all that demographic by school, by district on Desi's web website. So um, it, it, there's a lot and kind of overwhelming that amount of data yeah. that's there. Um, but there's also a lot more data um, actually that's there. Ms. Just a point, if you do, I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead, Ms. 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 Uh, if you are looking at student to teacher ratio on the Desi website, they do factor in that total number of certified staff with the student population. So. It, it might be somewhat misleading. You might see a student-to-teacher ratio of, say, 14 to 1, but you've already heard we don't have class sizes of 14. Right. That factors in every certified staff, not just classroom teachers. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Fitzgibbons. Thank you. <clears throat> um, just a few clarifying questions, if I may, Mr. Powers. Of course. Um, you, you're essentially pro proposing a $103 million um, initial budget operating yes operating budget and is it your um, opinion that were that budget to be funded we would have all of the staff we needed to execute on our student success plan over the next five years what I'm asking is we wouldn't be coming back in the absence of obviously student growth population wise to, but we wouldn't be coming back next year and saying we need more for the same number of students, we need more staff. Well, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great question, Mr. Fitzgibbons, and I I can't say we wouldn't be coming back. I do think there's other positions. You know, when you look at say, uh, I'll use this as an example, the high school music teacher. Um, you know, we've also um, at one time we had additional um, art staff at the high school, and so I think when you look at say the fine arts overall, you know, could we increase that? Uh, you know, we look at some of the requirements at the high school in terms of physical education. Um, you know, and again, back to compliance. You know, if, if trying to prioritize, yes, I think this would be the majority of positions. I, I don't want to say that, that's fair. I mean, there, there, there'd be above and beyond. I guess what I'm asking is there'd be above and beyond additional positions next year that wouldn't just be student growth, but things that have been intentionally yes. 
left out, if you will. Not left out. No, I know. It's things that, positions that haven't been accounted for. Okay, yeah. There would certainly not be another 60 positions. Right, no, no, no. I, uh, it's, yes, it's, there the may most, be. it's the most. Yes. It's yes. the blind chair. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, second, uh, if I may. Um, do, do, do. Oh, yeah, when, when we talk about adding 60 staff, we have, uh, and then we have our fixed cost <clears throat> series. Is that staff included in the fixed cost series so that their insurance and everything like that is included in that fixed cost? Yes, we, we do feel as though when we looked at increasing staffing and what we had budgeted for health insurance, that that would be able to absorb uh, if we were able to get those 60 staff members. Okay, so the 1.2 million anticipated health insurance cost increase is based on 60 additional staff, not just the staff we have today. Uh, correct, it includes additional staff. And okay. All you know, right. but using that 10% anticipated increase, we're hoping, like this past year, it wasn't as much as that. So we're hoping when we get that final number that you know we, we might not necessarily need to have all that money tied up in gotcha. uh, insurance. Yeah. But no, that, that makes sense, thank you. Um, transportation increase of approximately $2 million. Um, that's a number that you're relatively confident in that we will have to pay next year. I mean, within a margin of error, obviously, yes. but it's not going to be 200,000, and it's not going to be 5 million. It's going to be between, let's call it, one and a half and two and a half million. Yes, what we really tried to do is obviously look at what the contract calls for, right. look at what we are spending, uh, slated to spend this year, and obviously, I've already, you know, kind of gone over some of those unanticipated increases. We do feel as though that that increase would be as accurate as possible without the, to your point, the unknowns. Right. Um, we would certainly have a, a few additional movements that maybe we didn't in include, or um, you know, some unforeseen. But yes, yeah, so we do feel that two percent, that two million dollars would be closer to what we anticipate versus, you know. When we're talking budgets up now, uh, you obviously see some of those lines. I think we probably, um, right, you know, under budgeted, so we want to make sure that we're. So I guess my, my point is that two million dollars is on a, a current operating budget of just under ninety million. So that's driving a two percent increase in what we need to do right out of the gate, essentially. Yes, there are some of those exactly the, some of those fixed costs that are yeah. just, just driving the budget even before we add any type of additional. Yeah, and, and the same thing for tuition costs. That, that's another that's another six tenths of a percent, roughly. So we're 2.6% increase in just to f fund those fixed costs and, and, and tuition. So that's a number everyone has to bear in mind. And then I do want to um, just point out that actually the town of Bridgewater is the biggest funding source of the district at 32 million. Chapter 70 is 31. Uh, the town of Rainham is 21 million. Um, but what the key thing is about Chapter 70 is because it's roughly, and I will include Chapter 71 too, it's roughly 40% of our total revenue if you add those two together, right? If the state is only going to increase you 1%, right, then we have, and, and we, we asked just for a 3% overall budget increase, and the state's only going to give you one on 40% of your revenue, you've got, that leverages both towns to have to pay 4 to 5% increase in their assessment just to get to a 3% overall number for ourselves. And, and, and that's very important for everyone to realize is, you know, the state also, and Please reach out to your state senators and state representatives to to advocate for um, fair treatment of uh, regional school districts in the budget. Um, they they have to maintain a, a reasonable um, inflationary increase in Chapter 70 and 71 to really make this work. Otherwise, we're just both our towns are getting leveraged by the money the state won't give us. Is exactly. that fair? I, yes, I think that's fair to say, and I think that's a great point. You know, when we look at, as uh, Madam Chair and Ms. King shared, you know, you look at a 500000 approximately $500,000 increase from last year in Chapter 70, we have been factoring or counting on really what we've received the last couple of years, which is anywhere from three to four 
million more from the previous year. You know, we were hoping that was going to be the case. So if you know, and we're anticipating uh, that revenue to come in. Yes, now that burden shifts to your point, Mr. Fitzgibbons, unfortunately, to the towns, and, and we want to obviously be a partner with them and work with what they can uh, provide us. Powers, um, out of the 13 interventionists, how many of these are these, including ones with ESSER grant money that they run out? Uh, yes, uh, great point. Yes, so the, the ones, um, we currently have uh, eight, uh, Mr. DiMarino, currently eight interventionists uh, across the district at the elementary, middle school, and high school. So this would be an increase, obviously, to those eight. Our ultimate goal would be able to keep the eight that we currently have, uh, certainly first and foremost, and then if funding is available, uh, to be able to add additional interventions. Okay. Just a follow up. Can you just detail uh, for the audience how important these positions are for our students? Absolutely. I, I think, you know, when we start to look at, like, again, the, the needs and, and gaps, I, I know we're a couple years out um, from COVID, uh, but I think. You know, we're still seeing the long-term effects and impacts of COVID. We have to remember that our students, um, you know, were at home uh, for a good portion of time. And unfortunately, that especially with our um, all students now that are in, say, third, fourth, uh, fifth grade, uh, that, that was their formative years. They were kindergarten, first grade. Uh, you know, that, that we have a lot. Unfortunately, there's gaps. And we have some, uh, you know, uh, work to do to close those gaps. These interventionists, are assisting obviously our classroom teachers who are working you know as hard as they possibly can uh, but they're able to again provide those additional opportunities additional support for mediation acceleration to the students that may have um, you know demonstrating a particular gap in a could be a particular topic could be a particular subject uh, obviously we're focusing most of our efforts on early literacy um, and then obviously numeracy as well as we can go up say uh, in the upper grades and then high school as well but yes, I, I, I can't uh, say enough how important these positions are to our overall student success. And I think our principals would attest, um, you know, anytime you go into a building, uh, Mrs. Barry and I would walk the buildings, we're always seeing the interventions with small groups of students providing that additional support. Uh, so they, they are, again, just like the rest of our staff there, they're working as hard as they possibly can. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Powers, along those lines, I know nationally and within the state, there, there's a lot of talk around this, uh, the ESSER cliff and what is happening. Um, excuse me, you talked about the eight positions that are in the interventionist. Are there other positions that we have um, that are being funded through the ESSER grant money that are going to drop? Uh, no, uh, we were very <laughs> mindful uh, not to move any other positions over the operational budget that weren't already presented to you. Um, you know, we felt as though that um, we wanted to avoid this potential cliff and so we really were mindful of that and you know we over the last two years uh, incrementally moved some of those positions from ESSER funding uh, we look at some of our school nurses that we were able to add through ESSER funding they were uh, included in the operational budget uh, but really our interventionist positions were kind of the bulk of that and we did keep them uh, on the ESSER grants uh, so to answer your question I'm not sure if I 100% <coughs> no we do not have any other positions So typically what happens each year, uh, I, I guess, if I think I know what you're asking, so let me give you an answer, and then if not, I'll certainly uh, address it. Um, we don't necessarily use at the end of the year the D&D &D, uh, fund to, to help offset and balance our current budget. What we typically do is use D&D &D for a future budget. So at the end of the year, uh, any type of surplus funds that we may have uh, goes into D&D. &D. Uh, once that is reviewed and certified, you know, obviously Ms. Babalola has a sense of what's going to be in there. Uh, and then what we do is, uh, what school committee does, vote to use some of that e to 
offset the next year's budget. And that could range and vary depending on the year, depending on the financial situation that we may be faced with. It could be, uh, you know, we uh, school committee votes to approve using a million dollars from Andy to help offset the assessments of the town for next year's budget. Um, so it's not necessarily ever used, uh, or at least to my knowledge, has been used in current situations to help balance the budget. It's typically used for future budgets. Uh, you know, it's, it's used for other things as well. I mean, we've obviously used some of it for the traffic and tennis court uh, project, but those were uh, above and beyond expenses. Uh, obviously, the price came in higher. Uh, we didn't have that money in there, so we were obviously able to use some of that money for those purposes. Within the same year? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, if I'm understanding you correctly, it is rare that you need additional funds each year. It's like what you budget is what you spend. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you just kind of do without them. Yeah, it's not, um, it, I guess if you were equated to, say, at home spending, it's not, oh, the checkbook's a little light, I'm going to move some money from savings. That's not, whatever we are budgeted, that's what we have for our money, and that's what we, we use. Is so. there underspending? Uh, there are times where, again, we end up with a, a surplus at the end of the year. Uh, we might anticipate that a certain line. Uh, for example, transportation. There have been years where um, transportation hasn't exceeded what we anticipated. Uh, and actually, we get uh, credit from Mr. Lucini, and we say, I should say just for Mr. Lucini, but Lucini, uh, because of uh, fuel costs are lower than anticipated. So th there could be uh, surplus funding there. Uh, we may not have as many students going out of district, or maybe we had. I'll just give a, a, you know, a rough number. This is certainly isn't accurate. 10 students that are out of district, all of a sudden this heart and her department bring three of those students back in district. That's now a savings that we uh, weren't counting on. So at, yes, there are times where we do have surplus funding at the end of the year. And again, that money goes right into the e &D. How often does that happen? I would say every year uh, thus far, uh, we've always had money at the end of the year, every year. Uh, to put in there. And again, the amounts vary depending and um, what may be left. Uh, you know, again, if it's, if it's a, a, a winter like last year, we'll, we'll probably have a little bit more because we didn't have all the heating costs uh, per se, or we didn't have to you know, put the plows out as many times and sand, so we'll have some savings there. Um, there's been years where it's been a little less than a million um, because, you know, we obviously um, want to be try to be as conservative as possible. We want to, if this is what we've asked the towns and the state for, we want to try to spend as much as possible, but know that we also want to be able to help the towns in our situation with fall the year we can. So do you ever um, put back into the budget items that you've taken out, say mid-year, when you see that your spending is under budget and you have the resources, versus just having it be a cost savings and rolling it into e and maybe? Has that ever happened? Uh, yes, I, 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 I know what's happened. I can't necessarily give you yeah. a concrete example, but yes, there have been times where middle of the year, um, we might need an additional nurse, a teacher, uh, an additional ESP, or um, I, you know, even a substantially separate program, but maybe we're out of compliance in one room because we have so many students. Um, and we would certainly work with Ms. Davalola and her team to say, okay, what did we have budgeted? You know, yep, uh, we actually, um, you know, the, the teacher that we hired, um, their salary was less than anticipated, so obviously we know there's a little savings there. So that we might be able to shift that money and actually bring some of those uh, additional staff members on, or um, there's times where we need things. You know, the principals might say, "I'm not a copy paper," and again, we'll kind of go through the line and say, "Oh, well, actually, we didn't order as much as we anticipated, or one school used more, one school used less, and we can you know, move that money." Thank you so much. So, Definitely. if I could, Madam Chair, historically, um, we have typically taken between one and 1.5 million from e and every year to offset the following year's operational budget. So I would expect um, the budget subcommittee to look at that again for this coming budget. Um, I, I think that that's something that we have uh, tried to do as a show of support to our, to our funding sources as the towns. Um, not so much at the state level, but from the town's perspective, um, that it is a, a, a three-way street, if you would. Um, yes, the majority comes from 
our towns, but we also take out of our savings as well. I do want to just point out as a, uh, a piece that I just want to make sure that everybody's aware of. So there are times where the school committee does have to vote to take money out of e and typically in the summer, September time, when uh, we get a late bill from the previous fiscal year. When that happens, we have to vote as a school committee to take the money from e and to pay that bill. We cannot pay that bill from the operating, or the budget that we're currently in. We have to go back and take it out of e and to pay it. Because you already rolled sure. that money over. Correct, that money's been rolled into e and and therefore we go back to e and to get it and pay it. But that is done strictly by us through a vote. That's not something the administration can do um, on their own. That has to be a certified vote by the school committee. So. And I'd just like to emphasize what Mr. Dolan said. I, I mean, if you look at uh, slide number nine and you look at the budget process sources of funding, uh, we've got dis you've got a district line that's 1.4 million, 1.6, 1.6, and then for this current fiscal year, 2.2, and that's mostly made up of E and D rollover. So when we talk about using E and D for operations, what really happens is because the superintendent always puts a a budget freeze on what October 1st, then. You know, you're not going to spend money unless you have a really good reason to spend money after October 1st uh, on, on whatever. And so that's what generates some of the e and money as well, is that, you know, there's a lot of hawks over there looking to make sure the money is being spent correctly, which I love. Thank you. And, um, and, and so then what happens is we generate this extra, and it's used to help fund the next year's operations. So that you're not running right on the ragged edge of zero all the time, but you've got a little bit, and then you know, okay, now I can roll a little bit to next year with the plan of doing the same thing. You know, I think that's the best way to describe it. It, it is, and if I could, yeah. um, by by state law, we are allowed to carry five percent of our budget in E and D, and as long as I've been around, we've never had five percent. We have always spent. Um, so I just, that is. Which would be four to five million dollars. <laughs> correct, correct. So I just want to sort of add that to the, yeah. to the conversation as well. The state does allow us to have up to five years. And right now we care about, we try not to go below 1.5. Is that what Historically, you're... for me, that's where <laughs> I like to sit, never <laughs> below 1.5. don't know. I mean, one day a boiler could go kaput in this building, and if that's on us. So. Is that what we have in there now? Uh, I think it's certified uh, 3.2. 3.7. 3.7 uh, million in our well, so some we, of that we, will took, be used. we took money already for this year out of that 3.7. For the track and tennis course, mm -hmm. right. so, yeah. And then that money will be used to offset next year's budget. I just want to thank Mr. Powers and the administration team. Um, this is not an easy process at all. Uh, I know that this is uh, something that takes a lot of effort and a lot of time from all of you. Um, and unfortunately, this is where, the, as we used to say, the pencils get sharpened. Unfortunately, positions, I can't imagine we're going to be able to move forward with all 60 positions. Uh, but, so I, I want to thank you all for that work um, because it's not, it's not easy. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, again, to our town officials, thank you for being here. Thanks a lot. Next, we'll move on to Mrs. Babalula and electricity conference.
Oh, yes. What? We have to approve. Excuse we have to motion. Oh, we do. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Hold on. Sorry. So yes, um, make a motion to approve uh, to, uh, refer, to refer the budget, uh, the preliminary budget to the budget, the 2025 preliminary budget. Why am I doing this? Motion to refer the 2025 preliminary budget to the budget uh, subcommittee for further pencil charge. Second. second. Uh, motion has been made by Mr. Dolan, second by Mrs. King. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Sorry. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, Superintendent Powers, and members of the audience. My mission here tonight is to present to you the district electricity contract, ENP 55, for the upcoming school years. It has been five years since the statewide electricity contract, ENP 49, was awarded. This contract will end this year, September 2024. Last year, the OSD consultant, Mr. Alvin, presented to the budget subcommittee on the proposed <coughs> contract that the state is currently working on. The primary focus of this is to help government agencies and businesses succeed in procuring commodities such as this. This new contract, ENE55, will seek to identify supply vendors who will service interested eligible entities. This contract has benefited the district tremendously. We felt joining this pool of buyers going forward will continue to foster bulk purchasing <coughs> power, and the district will also benefit from the expertise of procuring such commodities. The initial term on this contract is up to 36 months with a renewal for up to two or three, up to one or two options, which may be executed based on the individual term length by not more than a total of five years. The new contract will start on September 4, uh, September 1st, 2024. In the Current contract prices for 12 between 12 and 36 months were around eight cents per kilowatt. It was communicated to us that although prices fell in 2023, but the market is predicting higher prices for the following reasons: number one, lack of pipeline capacity; number two the growing demand of electricity out there, and also geopolitics, which is the war that is going on in Ukraine and also in the other part of the world. So based on these reasons, the current indicative pricing as of September 2023 for a September 2024 contract is projected at for a 12 month, con 12 month contract is about 12 cents per kilowatt. 24 month con contract, it's about the same thing, about 12 cents and some change. For the 36 month contract, is also about 12 month, I mean 12 cents. So overall, we're looking at between 42% and 48% increase over what we're currently paying. So in summary, we won't know the new contract rate until the procurement is concluded in April 2024, which is this year, a few months. So we have been advised by, the, by our consultant to anticipate a 50% increase over what we currently pay. So therefore, I am requesting for permission to participate on behalf of this district in the upcoming ENE 55 big contract for up to 36 month time with 
about one or two options to increase based on the initial time for a maximum five years. Thank you. Motion to allow Mrs. Babalola to enter into negotiations. We we heard about this at an earlier school committee meeting, and I think this is just pro forma to allow her to do it. collective effort here, uh, Madam Chair. So yes, uh, as you know, each year school committee is responsible for um, approving school choice for the upcoming school year. We certainly as, or we certainly as a school committee have the option of, um, of approving it or not approving it. Certainly a non-approval requires a little bit more um, work uh, in, in terms of the, what the next steps are. Uh, but Ms. Watson and Ms. Babalola and, and I have, and Ms. McDougal have spoken about school choice for next year. Uh, we would like to continue on with the program. Um, obviously, uh, you know, there are some benefits to being a, a school choice district in that we do receive additional funding for these students uh, that uh, you know, the school choice in. Um, however, you know, there are some times where it does place a, a burden on the district, and so that's something that we need to review um, in terms of uh, class size. Um, you know, as uh, Ms. Watson has shared in the past, limited the grade levels uh, certain years because of class size. And I know looking ahead to next year, that would also be our proposal. Uh, obviously, we you know, continue to allow the students that are currently here on school choice to remain, but obviously uh, we would like to limit uh, <coughs> for next year uh, for class size. But Ms. Babalola, if I didn't include anything, or if there's anything else no, to add, or Ms. Watson, if I didn't uh, accurately capture that. I'm sorry, that's, a, that's probably well, that's, that's, that's a good question, Ms. Martelli. Uh, yes, ninth grade, we would yeah. propose that the next year uh, for ninth grade only. Ninth Just grade only. Ninth grade only. Is there a uh, In terms of uh, new enrollees, obviously students that are here in the right. other grades right. would allow, be allowed to stay, yes. Is there a certain amount of slots? Like, how does it work? I'm not working from the Oh, sure, no, absolutely. So uh, it really is a starts with a conversation with um, Ms. Watson when we look at enrollment, uh, what's projected for next year. Uh, coming up from eighth grade. Obviously we know that we're going to have some students um, you know, leave the district because they're gonna go to a vocational school or private school, uh, but then we look at uh, what currently we can anticipate for class size, what offerings we can currently you know, provide these students and, and these students that are currently in school choice and obviously within the district, and we, we then make a recommendation. In years past, we have opened it up nine through 12 if enrollment has been down at the high school. Uh, the last couple of years, uh, we've seen enrollment start to increase at the high school level. Um, so again, it, it's just something we want to be cautious about. Um, although there are benefits because of the revenue stream, um, you know, there are some uh, cons, I guess you would say, to, to it as well. Is there a certain schools that we partner with? Like, who is it up? Like, is it, I don't know. Uh, it, it really, yes. Once we elect to uh, take students in, they can come from anywhere okay. uh, around. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, Taunton, Brockton, uh, Lakeville, Freetown, West Bridgewater, really the surrounding towns, because we don't provide transportation, it really is um, on the families, or you know, depending on the age of the student to get transportation. Uh, so I would say pretty much local, but we have had students a little bit further away than, than you would uh, imagine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes, Mr. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Uh, I know last year we did it grades nine through 12, and just said that if they enrolled in that, they can stay. Um, where this is grade nine, if, if we get a, a student that chooses to come here, are they allowed to come back from grade 10 if, say, next year, the, where we're at capacity, you know, we're not going to opt into it. How does that work? Y yes, right now we're anticipating that any student that enrolls in grade nine would be able to finish his or her high school career here at the yard, but they would move up through the grade levels. And Mr. Powers, one question I have is the, this down for us a little bit, is the, the slots, it's kind of variable depending on how many kids actually come, so we really don't know those number of slots until summer. And what I know about some other schools that do school choice, some kids are getting accepted two or three days before school starts because of some For of the of reasons, yes. the numbers and all yeah, that. Students so decide. And also, they get accepted somewhere else. Right. Right. There's a, it's a move, the numbers are moving. Yes, the number moves a little bit. Yes. 
So we don't have to accept people? Like, if they, what do they submit to, like, apply? Is there an application to apply? So, so there is an application. Yeah. Okay. Um, they do have to apply. Mm -hmm. uh, there is not many restrictions that the state allows districts to put on. Um, students that uh, elect, you know, where they obviously have to go through the process, and the process had to be complete. But in terms of us looking at, you know, academics, uh, disciplinary data, all of those uh, can be exclusionary factors. Uh, so basically, if a student applies for school choice, has completed the process, has applied on time, uh, and we have open slots, uh, we can cap it. So for example, if Ms. Watson says, you know, I'll just throw a number out, 50 students um, and, you know, 60 apply. She's like, yeah, no, stop, yeah. stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you, yeah, how do you decide? So then, then it would become a lottery. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I know in the past, um, we timestamp the applications as they come in. So, you know, this one's first, this one's second, this one's third. So it's, it, there's no lottery. It's like whoever gets there first. Oh, makes sense. Uh, yeah. Other questions? I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve school choice for the 2024-2025 school year for the ninth grade only. Second. A motion to be made by Mr. Dolan, second by Ms. Martelli. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next is the approval of the warrants dated uh, December 14th, December 28th, and January 11th. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Motion to be made by Mr. Fitzgibbon, second by Mrs. King. No discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Right. Uh, other business? Anyone? Public comment? Okay. At this time, I will entertain a motion. Oh, wait. Second. Mr. Dillon, is that Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon, is that Mr. Dillon?